Okay. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna get started. One of the few good things about COVID is that um, many of these virtual meetings get started on time, which is, which is great. So um, thank you everybody. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. This is our second annual CRUISE symposium and CRUISE stands for Center for Research on Women's Health and Sex Differences. The, our mission is to fill knowledge gaps in women's health by expanding multidisciplinary research into women's health and sex differences here at Cedar sinai and by providing to do this by providing grants to these researchers to help them get their preliminary research obviously everybody knows you cannot do research without money and we have been very fortunate in our initial uh, year and a half or so uh, to be able to fund six grants uh, since last year with uh, a much appreciated philanthropy a very special thank you to Virginia and Christopher Roosevelt, who are representing the William H. Donner Foundation. They were not only our first donors, but they are also to date our largest donors. And I'm not sure if they're on. I think they might be on. Um, and if you are here, uh, we want to really thank you very much, Virginia and Christopher. Um, we also want to thank, and someone needs to meet Maybe Laura needs to mute. Um, and we also want to thank the Louis B. Mayer Foundation and its board for being our and they, with their uh, philanthropy, we were able to fund our second research project here. You're going to hear both our first and second research researchers that give, are going to give their updates this afternoon. In addition, with ongoing support from the William H. Donner Foundation and with Cedar sinai we've been able to fund four new grants this year, and you will be introduced to their topics and their researchers today, but without hearing any detail. Um, I also want to point out that um, since all of this research is really dependent on philanthropy, if any of you are interested in, in working with us, please feel free to contact me or Michelle or, with, or Ali Shoji uh, for more information. This work is also dependent on our, the leadership from our steering committee, the time and effort that we as a group have put into this, and we are deliberately multidisciplinary. The pictures are on, up on the screen right now, and I just want to remind everybody of the, t of the areas that we are, have expertise in. I'm an OBGYN and specifically maternal fetal medicine. Dr. Noelle Barry Mers is world re renowned for her women in heart disease, and she has many titles. I'm not going to give you those titles, but she's an expert clinician researcher. Uh, Dr. Mariko Ishimori is a clinician researcher in rheumatology. Dr. Carolyn Jeffries is a basic scientist also in rheumatology. Nicole Leonard is our vice president and associate dean for research here at Cedar sinai Dr. Parker is another basic scientist in the Schmidt Heart Institute, and Dr. Saikot is our chair of neurology, and her subspecialty is uh, MS, multiple sclerosis. And we really appreciate, I really appreciate all of their input. Um, I also want to thank our host committee. The host committee has been really helpful for us in getting the word out and talking about us and, and trying to convince people that this is a very important area to fill this gap about women's health and knowledge about women. Uh, Laura Brill, Dana Guerin, Michelle Kidley, and Marjorie Santori Besson. M much thanks to the to four of you. And finally, uh, Sylvia Guzman, who really uh, is the person who makes gets everything done. We sit around and talk, and Sylvia makes it all happen. So thank you, thank you, Sylvia, uh, including this presentation today. So uh, a couple details uh, about this afternoon. Uh, after our guest speaker, Dr. Doris Taylor, presents her topic, which will be a great talk, you will hear summaries of two research teams that I alluded to already. You will then be introduced to our four newest grant award winners briefly. And after that, there'll be four short talks, each 15 minutes from four different researchers at Cedar sinai who are all talking about different aspects of women's health. And the point I want to make is all 10 of these topics are show the variety, basically women's health crosses every single department. And you will see this today as you as you listen to this. There'll be some very basic science talks and there'll be talks that are more clinically, um, uh, seem more clinically relevant. All of them are excellent. So thank you once again for your time. We really appreciate you being here and I hope you have leave today with a little bit of new knowledge and maybe some new questions. Thank you. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Uh, Barry Mers to introduce Dr. Taylor. 
Oh, let me let me say one more thing. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. If you want to ask a question, um, we 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 value questions. You can either put it in the chat box or you can raise your hand, and every person will have a little hand by their name on their computer. And if you click that, we'll see that you raised your hand. So sorry. Go ahead, Noel. Now you're muted. Oh, Bob, 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 Bob. Now you're good. Now you're good. Who muted me? Okay. Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then they, no one heard. The chat box is in the lower right hand corner of your computer. Uh, it is my great delight to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, my good friend, colleague, and amazing innovator, Dr. Doris Taylor. Uh, Dr. Taylor is an innovative, insightful, scientific pioneer and entrepreneur. She has published extremely in high impact factor journals. She holds over 30 patents and she is the founder of multiple companies dedicated to regenerative medicine. She has held academic positions for over 20 years and now recently has founded Regen Medics Consulting to serve both the academic and commercial enterprises in the regenerative medicine space to put the findings from regenerative medicine into the daily life of the patients that we serve to improve human health. Dr. Taylor is an innovator in the late 90s at Duke University. She described the first functional repair of an injured heart with cells. This is when I met Dr. Taylor. And uh, everyone said it was impossible, and yet she showed that it was possible. Ten years later at the University of Minnesota, her group transformed the field of tissue and organ engineering by developing a unique method to remove cells from otherwise unusable organs, leaving the intact organ scaffold on an extracellular matrix behind. This was so revolutionary that it was recognized as one of the top 10 research advantage, advances by the American Heart Association. And Dr. Taylor was nominated as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. At Texas Heart, Taylor built a CAP accredited NIH supported by repository uh, a uh, profiling core lab, uh, regenerative medicine for multiple NHLBI networks, medical centers, research foundations in the US and Canada. I uh, invited Dr. Taylor to serve with me on a scientific advisory board uh, several decades ago because of her groundbreaking research demonstrating that regenerative medicine cells used to either repair a damaged organ or to grow a new organ on the exoskeleton, uh, which she received that AHA uh, award, worked when you used female cells. And it did not work when you used male cells. And this made intuitive sense to me what is unique about female biology? What is different from male biology? The ability to make new life and make new cells. Uh, I've had the honor and privilege to work with Dr. Taylor, to write with Dr. Taylor, to have a glass of wine with Dr. Taylor. She's an amazing, amazing woman. And I will turn this over to her now. Uh, you are gonna love this talk. Thank you. Doris, you I want to make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me now? I can. Perfect. Perfect. First of all, thank you, Noelle. And it, it's an honor and a privilege to give this talk. What a great uh, opportunity and what a great group. I'm, I'm always so impressed with what's going on at Cedars and by Noelle and her colleagues in this field. And it, it's usually as insightful for me to be able to listen as it is to talk. So thank you, and it's a it's a uh, pleasure to be here. So the I to, for the sake of full disclosure, I have started several companies, and I do receive royalties from one of them about the desell resell ideas I'm going to talk about. But the bottom line is, I'd love to innovate and uh, move forward with new ideas and. 
And if you haven't seen the sticker on the bottom, I highly recommend it, uh, Steminist. And a Steminist is a person who supports and advocates for women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, I would say also in medicine. And uh, I think that describes most of us in this, uh, in this group today. And I can't really give a talk without giving credit to the people in my group over the years who've done the work. The people in my most recent group were the folks at Texas Heart Institute, and they really made everything I'm gonna do possible. So my goals today are to really describe the basis for current regenerative medicine therapies for cardiovascular disease, the current state of sex differences, both sex differences and sex differences reporting in at least cell-based regenerative medicine therapies, biologic factors that may play into future regenerative medicine solutions, and what I think is coming down the pike for cardiovascular regenerative medicine. If you want to understand the problem, it's pretty straightforward. Cardiovascular disease, as you all know as well as I or better than I, kills more men, women, and children than any other disease. And yet, the analyses of biological sex differences are rare in cardiovascular disease and research animals, and clear, yet the data that are out there show clear sex differences exist and the prevalence, progression, and mechanisms underlying cardiovascular disease, both preclinically and clinically. Patients respond differently based on their biology no matter what disease field we're talking about. But clinical trial data analyses on sex-specific differences are lacking. And because regenerative medicine is based on biology, it has to consider sex differences. So what do I mean by regenerative medicine? Well, I start by saying regenerative medicine is basically the concept that we can treat an underlying injury rather than the symptoms that we can actually repair injury, damage, or disease and restore function to a more normal state rather than simply asking the remainder of an injured tissue or organ to work harder to compensate. It's a potential solution for many diseases well beyond the cardiovascular space, but it's personalized medicine and it uses biologics as a tool. The 21st Century Cures Act passed by Congress and uh, in, uh, accepted by the FDA and the NIH defines regenerative medicine products as cells, genes, and tissue engineered medical products. Because they're biologic and include a biologic component, they have to reflect biology. So let me take you through the, what I'm talking about in terms of regenerative medicine and my worldview. My worldview, some of you have heard me say this many times, but my worldview is that endogenous repair for most of our lives is the norm. If you think about if a, two, if a, if a four-year-old gets COVID, they are not sick for six weeks or three months or 10 months. If a 62-year-old gets COVID, they may very well be. If a two-year-old falls down and scrapes their knee, turns red, scabs, it repairs, it regenerates. And that's because for most of our lives, endogenous repair is a norm until it isn't. And that is because endogenous stem, progenitor, and immune cells respond to the inflammation that occurs with injury to actually attempt to mediate repair. So injury leads to inflammation. Inflammation actually triggers the recruitment of stem or progenitor cells and immune cells from bone marrow and locally from tissues. But as we age and with chronic diseases or even with chronic inflammation, the number and potency of available cells, not just stem cells, goes down. So about 20 years ago now, 
our regenerative medicine goal in the cardiovascular space became to develop therapies to increase reparative cell number, increase cell function and potency, increase cell survival under stress, acknowledging we were putting them in a stress molar environment, and then ultimately to decrease inflammation and promote healing. One thing I should say is that if you get the right cells there, you tend to turn off the inflammatory response. If you don't, your body ramps up inflammation. And to the rheumatologists in the group, I apologize for the, the uh, bastardization of the language here. But um, you ramp up inflammation, and basically then your body says, hey, I said send me cells. And then you start getting a chronic inflammatory response and pro-inflammatory cells. So our goal is to get the right cells there at the right time to decrease inflammation, promote healing, potentially even reverse structural changes, but prevent the downside, uncontrolled cell proliferation. Nobody really wants to say, hey, the good news is you no longer have damage in your heart. The bad news is you have a tumor. So unfortunately, with aging and with many chronic diseases and diseases associated with aging, a failure of cell-based repair occurs. As we age, cell replication slows or stops, stem, progenitor, and immune cell numbers decline, reparative cell potency declines, organ vasculature and architecture stiffens. But these differ in men and women, and we don't talk about that very much. So here's a decrease in peripheral blood progenitor cells with age. And this was some work I did with Amir Lehrman a number of years ago. But with increased age, cardiovascular disease increases as progenitor cells decline. And you can see here aortic plaque burden as a marker of cardiovascular disease, and a particular progenitor, CD34 positive cells in bone marrow, and the inverse relationship there. But if you look at this in men and women, you can see that the in increase in cardiovascular disease occurs much earlier in men and plateaus and occurs much later in women, but increases dramatically. And women actually catch up with men by the seventh decade. At the same time, the decrease in cells parallels inversely the progression of disease. So there has to be a failure of endogenous processes that are involved in this. And although heart disease is affected by both sex and gender, and I'll come back to that, and kills a, one woman a minute and affects five times more women than cancer, heart disease research really doesn't uh, represent women very well. Less than 10% of clinical trial reports results for men versus women. So the question is, is regenerative medicine better? Well. A major tool since 2000 in regenerative medicine is cell therapy. But autologous cell therapy is based on the assumption that cells can be delivered to a patient and are capable of responding to injury and mediate repair. There are a number of cell types that have been used to skeletal myoblasts, bone marrow, mononuclear and mesenchymal cells, human embryonic stem cells, human iPS cells, umbilical cord cells, and more recently, cell-derived products, exosomes, conditioned media, even microRNAs. But there's a flaw in the logic of, of autologous cell therapy, and that is based on what I just told you, that cells decrease with disease and age. Moreover, it occurs differently in every patient, and yet, we assume that we can take cells from any given patient and that those cells are going to be the same and deliver them and then put them in a stressful environment and get a similar response. So patients differ, products differ, and essentially every patient in autologous cell therapy is getting a different drug. 
Moreover, the cells in the product are also present in the individual from whom they were harvested endogenously. And when they're harvested, that's an active process. So cells are mobilized endogenously, they don't just go to injury sites, and they secrete many, many active non-cellular molecules and products. And the clinical implications are profound. So right now, there are 582 cell therapy clinical trials registered for heart disease, 85 of which are recruiting. For context, there are 7,000 non-cardiovascular stem cell therapy trials, the majority of which are immuno-oncology. But what we know is that after 20 years, there are small improvements in function, reduced heart failure hospitalization, improved heart failure outcomes, and a minimal effect on EF and acute MI. But all the studies have been conducted primarily in men over age 60, where cell number has gone down, using autologous cells, where every patient gets a different drug. So if we look a little deeper, we can say cells are safe, bone marrow cells improve EF by about 3%, and in heart failure, cells can give a greater than 12-month improvement in survival, rate of rehospitalization, functional class, quality of life, et cetera. But what do we know in women? Well, in 2020, there are about 85 stem cell therapy trials in heart right now. There are about tw there are 12 with mesenchymal cells. There are a number of them that are active and not recruiting, but about 100 that are recruiting. There are zero, literally, that list sex differences as a reporting variable. Beyond that, there are more recent human IPS induced pluripotent stem cell studies, exosome studies, and as of yesterday, there are no sex differences listed or reporting. And in fact, if you do a search for women in this listing, the most frequent listing for women is Brigham, Brigham and Women's Hospital, not women in the clinical trials. So what do we know about women in cardiovascular regenerative medicine? Very little, but I'm gonna take you through where we are. And one of the most promising articles, the first cell therapy that's gonna probably be approved if the phase three DREAM HF trial is positive, doesn't even mention the word women or female. So the question then becomes, does it matter? Does sex, age, race, ethnicity matter? Well, when we started looking through data over the last 20 years, the data either didn't exist or weren't reported in a manner that we could evaluate. So we went back to the lab. And I had convinced the NIH two decades ago to let me actually bank the cell product in patients enrolled in NIH-funded clinical trials, cell therapy clinical trials, bank peripheral blood and plasma, if the organ, if heart was explanted, collect the heart and then collect temporal samples. And I could link those in a de-identified way to individual patient data. So what that meant was that I could begin to look at not only patient characteristics and patient outcomes, and how those related to unique cell populations, but also how they related to each other and characteristics related to outcomes. So one of the questions I asked right away is, going back to the original acute MI cell therapy clinical trials where bone marrow mononuclear cells were delivered either three to five or seven to nine days post infarction, or in the case of the time trial, or 14 to 21 days after infarction in the late time trial, and I'll point out that the percentage of women was 12 to 17 percent in these studies, not really high. The question was, did EF, was EF different? And if you looked initially at the baseline EF, you could see, first of all, that the women who were enrolled in the study had a much higher EF, about 
nine to 10 units higher than those than men in time and about six units higher in late time. Now bear in mind that none of the data have been reported by sex. They've been combined to determine the efficacy of the therapy. So if you look at the time clinical, the EF primary endpoint at six months, and you look in men in blue and women in orange here, you can see that the Delta EF was similar in men and women in time. Not, not the same starting value, but a similar change. So you would think, okay, combining those data may be okay. Look at late time. Later, by two to three weeks after infarction, in women, there seems to be a decline in EF, whereas in men, there's a four point increase. And yet the efficacy is based on those combined data, which you would tend to think would negate each other. So then I went back and said, does sex also affect the cell product? Well, no cells are homogeneous, they're very heterogeneous. So we looked at a number of 40, 40 different cell populations. And what we found was that there were multiple cell populations that were affected by sex, CD11B, CD45 positive, three positive, CD45 positive, 14 positive, angiogenic cells, T cells, monocytes and macrophages, and B cells. And as we looked by sex, by cardiac risk factors, we found that a number of different parameters, sex, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, age, and smoking, all altered or all were associated with different ultimate compositions in the bone marrow. And when we started looking and asked the question whether it mattered, what we were able to show is that certain cell populations present in the bone marrow associated with poor recovery or good recovery. Now remember, I just told you CD11B is one such cell and that it's associated with poor recovery. And in fact, what we saw was a poorer recovery in women, but nobody has looked at these data by sex. And when I asked permission from the network to look at these data by sex, it was denied for multiple years because the studies were not powered to detect differences in women and could potentially lead to spurious interpretations. So what I ultimately was able to do was go to Marianne Ganoski, who had conducted a meta-analysis of bone marrow mononuclear cell therapy in acute MI and ask her if we could compare our data to the data in the accrued data set. And although none of, most of the data were not reported by sex, she was able to actually clean the data and help us look at the results by sex. And we found that there were some differences Women were of the, well, first of all, eight, only 18% of the women in all bone marrow mononuclear cell patients in all mononuclear cell trials were women. Women were older. They had lower peak CK. They smoked less, not surprising. Smaller volumes, not surprising. Higher prevalence of hypertension, again, not surprising. But in the cell-based therapy-treated women who were older, what we showed was that the treated females had a lower composite endpoint, stroke, AMI, and death, compared to placebo-treated females. And because data were not presented by sex, this has not been uh, noted or acknowledged. There was a numerically higher delta EF and a numerically lower death rate than in placebo-treated females. But again, this was small numbers and did not reach significance. But if you just compare women to men, you walk away from the trial saying there's no real difference in outcome. So 
we tried to submit those manuscripts, the, the manuscript for publication, for rejections and two internal conversations about how we're trying to overinterpret data later. We still are waiting to figure out what to do with those data. So those are unpublished data, but if you look at a number of clinical therap uh, therapies for heart disease, hmm, excuse me, 5,000 clinical trials for heart failure, only 12 report the differences by sex. For acute MI, 1,100, only seven. That was in 2016. The numbers have gone up about two, two to four fold in the last four years, but using stem cells as an intervention, we're still at one trial. So, but papers and online information exist. If you do a Google search for sex differences in cardiac cell therapy, there's 73,000 results. And, but, but seven of the first 10 listings are sex differences in cell therapy, mostly in animals. And yet most of the articles are published in low impact or open access journals. The numbers are increasing, but the terminology is an issue. And sex and gender are often used interchangeably, and I would argue incorrectly, including by me, because in many of the clinical trial networks, we are forced to use the term gender because we don't measure karyotype on any cells. So the role of gender on mesenchymal stem cell therapy is reported on the same cells, sex differences and gender differences are reported, and you won't necessarily find these together. So just to make the point, sex is biology, XX, XY, gender is a social self-perception construct, and both sex and gender have an impact, but we don't get to talk about them differently. So let me go for, back quickly ahead and say, there are also sex specific mechanisms that are being reported. Molecular and cellular differences in mice, sex differences in human cells in response to TNF, and gender differences in human cells, stem cell, cell death, and response to growth factors and growth factor secretion. So the bottom line is there are data out there, but they're not being reported differentially at any clinical level. And moreover, the kinds of data that are being reported, it's really important here to look at gender in a mesenchymal cell therapy trial. The first point is that, um, that there are differences in EF in serum cytokines, in cells, B cells, and in flow-mediated dilation functional effects by sex, but that is not what was reported in the clinical trial. That was a sub-analysis retrospectively done and reported later. So moreover, the kinds of comparisons that are happening is people are reporting menstrual cells versus Sertoli cells and saying female cells are more resistant to stress and express more growth factors. Now that's probably true. We know women rock and are superior, but the question is, is it female cells or is it the type of cells? That's not good science. There is a website that I would recommend uh, students and fellows look at at Stanford it's called Gendered Innovations and talks about how to do these kinds of studies and what to measure and how to report them. So beyond acute MI, does it matter? And I'm running short on time, so I'm gonna jump through this quickly and say that we also looked at the same sort of questions in heart failure. And what we were able to show was that improvements in heart failure outcomes also associated with six cell with several cell populations. And when we started looking 
The same cells keep showing up over and over. CD34, CD11B, C3431, 3. But the majority of these cells are not um, stem or progenitor cells. And it's forced us to address the question that in bone marrow, 95% of the cells aren't, and the cells that are associated with improvement are immune cells. Moreover, we know that the immune responses in men and women differ. And immune responses may be the key to regenerative medicine in men versus women. So what can we do with this information? I would argue we can better understand therapies. And the first personalized cell therapy in cardiovascular disease as a clinical trial is underway. This is a biocardia study called CardiAmp, 250 patients, double blind, randomized controlled trial, based on the data that we reported in heart failure where they actually are taking a small sample of bone marrow, harvested in an outpatient procedure, and only patients whose marrow has the cells that we've shown are associated with a positive response are enrolled in the trial. Only then are cells harvested, prepared, and delivered. Now, the, again, I don't know their trial design with regards to men and women, but it would be very interesting to see if more women than men uh, are enrolled and respond. So our cap accredited biobank has really let us do some mechanistic studies. It's also given us a big data set that we're now applying artificial intelligence to to look across six clinical studies to develop signatures of repair in men versus women. It's also enabled us to convince colleagues to look at non-regenerative medicine studies. And some of my colleagues at Sinai went back and looked at sex-based differences after mitral valve surgery. And we're actually able to show an important finding that of 251 patients, 40% were women, but at two years, women had a higher rate of all-cause mortality and of MACE. And women reported worse quality of life and functional status at two years, but this would not have been seen if we hadn't pushed for that subgroup analysis. So it all points us in new directions, but it points us also beyond cell therapy to how cells respond to their environment. Because stem cell therapy is based on the assumption that you can put cells in an environment, they'll respond and they'll mediate repair. But most of the stem cell effects are in the border zone of a scar and cells don't persist and the effects are deemed parakin. And I've said, what if cells really just need a hospitable environment and food, clothing, and shelter? And maybe we shouldn't just be looking at cells, we should be looking at the matrix. My interest in matrix came because I was trying to build an organ to deal the bone deal with the donor organ shortage. And I want to quickly show you that and close with an, uh, uh, how that led me to a new therapy for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So what we did is we basically said, you can build devices or you can build a heart. And we're going to move forward to try to build the heart based on the scaffold of a human cadaveric heart. I'm trying to go forward and it's not letting me go forward. There you go. And there are really two ways to do that. You can either do it through 3D bioprinting from the bottom up, but today that's not feasible. For biologics, you can only make something very small uh, or you, can make, you can't yet build vasculature and we know a heart won't live without a vasculature and you can't build thick structures or organs. Or you can do our process of taking a cadaveric organ on the left and using soap, literally baby shampoo, to wash all the cells out of the organ. And when you do that, you end up with an acellular scaffold seen in the third image here. 
in that acellular scaffold, if you add back human IPS cells, and the circle is to remind me to show, tell you that that's taken me 10 years and tens of millions of dollars to develop and get to the point that we can move forward. If you do that, you can rebuild vasculature and you can actually rebuild a functioning pediatric human-sized heart. And why pediatric human-sized? Because of the billions of cells it takes to get this far. But what we've been able to show is that we can take human IPS cells, transplant them into the scaffold, rebuild the heart that responds to dobutamine, synchronizes over time, has electrical uh, activity, responds to drugs appropriately, is vascularized, and retains 95% of the cell number that we see in cadaveric heart. So we can essentially rebuild a human heart from IPS cells. But what I told you before is that patient-derived cells are a problem. So with patient-derived cells come immature heart cells. And we've had to basically learn how to mature those cells. And I'm going to skip this to say that what we've had to do is recreate development and build small cardiac tissues that let us recapitulate human development with different extracellular matrix proteins. But the cool part was, as soon as we started doing that, and we took extracellular matrix from male and female hearts, what we learned is that female heart scaffold is different than male. And the female scaffold in heart, kidney, liver, and lung is stiffer at a younger age. My perception is that that's because women have to deal with an increased blood volume during pregnancy, but I can, of course, prove that. However, what we learn by learning that and by thinking, that led me immediately to the idea of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Women develop heart failure with uh, preserved EF three times more frequently than men, but half of all heart failure is with preserved ejection fraction and there's no treatment. And the bottom line is that in HEFPAF, the cardiomyocytes are in a very stiff environment and they can't re push against that ECM to relax, that extracellular matrix. And so that results in increased stiffness, compliance is decreased, relaxation is impaired. And the molecule that seems to be responsible for compliance in the cardiomyocyte is Titan. What we were able to show is that we could actually tune extracellular matrix, build a cardiac microtissue, put back all the components of adult heart, cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, smooth muscle cells, even immune cells, macrophages, and monocytes. And by doing that, we could modulate Titan in car uh, human cardiomyocytes and drive it so that it looked like healthy left ventricle. And what we've now been able to do is take cells from failing hearts and put them on tunable matrix and change their phenotype to a more, uh, to a less uh, failing mode. So for the first time, we may have a matrix-based treatment. So we started out trying to figure out how to deliver cells. We figured out quickly that male and female cells differed by biobanking that human, and we had to think about choosing the best cells. We moved to building a heart along the way. We learned that we could build tools for cardiomyocyte and endothelial cell expansion, but that even the underlying scaffold of a heart was different. We've used that to move towards ECM-based therapies, and now we're at trying to understand the right cell for the right patient in the right location and the right model. So remember the problem, regenerative medicine is based on biology and it has to consider sex differences. So now we basically have to do 
what we've talked about, not just do the science, but report the data by sex. We have to relate patient data response to biology. We have to power trials for data analyses of sex specific outcomes. And I would say journal editors and thought leaders have to drive this. No one else is going to be able to. NIH believes in it, wants to do it. I chaired the cardiovascular uh, panel discussing this, but we're not there yet. One of the thought leaders in this field is obviously you're at Cedar sinai Noelle Barry-Mers, and she's really pushed the envelope on a lot of this. And I would say all of us think it's impossible until it's done, but you get enough strong, smart women in the room and it's gonna happen. And so for any of you who are fe uh, fellows or students, as you tackle these questions, I have to say it's not gonna be easy and you're not always going to succeed, but Ann Richards actually basically said, you're going to be ha have to be smarter, faster, and better, but fortunately it isn't that hard. So figure out what you do, what motivates you, and remember, this is my last slide, stress equals inflammation equals aging, and if you don't believe me, just look at the pictures. And Oh, I do want to say, are there other options, alcohol, exercise, acupuncture, and show that we published a study again with Noelle on acupuncture um, in cardiovascular disease, very small study, and that exercise is also something we're evaluating. Most of all, have fun, because then you can do amazing things. And I'll stop there, and I'm, I know I went over, I apologize. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. And we have time for two questions. Uh, we have on the chat box, one from Dr. Susan Chang. Fascinating talk. At what earliest age equivalent is the heart scaffolding found to differ between females and males? It differs as young as we've looked. And it actually differs more at a younger age. And male hearts get stiffer um as they age and catch up with females and that may be why men also are developing heart failure with preserved ejection ejection fraction but at a later age good good to know pleasure to introduce dr banthala who is the initial award winner of our very first cruise grant so we're very excited to hear an update dr banthala received her undergraduate degree from nyu her md from ut southwestern at dallas and completed her medical residency at the university of illinois chicago uh in uh gastroenterology and hepato and then did a gastroenterology and hepatology fellowship at usc and an advanced fellowship in inflammatory bowel disease at cedar sinai she joined the inflammatory bowel disease faculty here at Cedars, where she co-leads a multidisciplinary preconception and pregnancy program for women with IBD in conjunction with me, basically, one of the only two programs in the US. Her research interests include therapeutic drug monitoring, patient education, and expanding knowledge of care in women in transgender patients with IBD. So Dr. Banthala is going to tell us about her Magnolia study. Dr. Banthala. Thank you so much. I hope everyone can see and hear me okay. Please let me know if you can't. All right, so thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Kilpatrick. I'm very happy to be presenting here on behalf of our colleagues. Um, we really want to thank the William H. Donner Foundation for their generous support. This is a topic that is near and dear to our hearts, and I'm excited to share with you some of our uh, novel findings and update you on the status of our project. So, Inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, it comprises of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Affects 3 million people in the US, with about half of those being affected being female. As you can see, the peak average of onset of IBD is in the 20s and 30s, so this disease really affects patients as they're contemplating starting a family. Symptoms of IBD include diarrhea, abdominal pain, we have elevated inflammatory markers in the blood and stool, we can see ulcerations on colonoscopies and endoscopies, and the medications we use, they can range from some milder, locally active therapies that are pill-based or to, well, quite frankly, most of our population at the IBD Center here, they're on broad, uh, quite uh, potent immunosuppressants, so in the form of infusions and injections. 
And a lot of patients, unfortunately, require surgery as well. So I do want to just take one second to just note the difference between IBD and IBS. So irritable bowel syndrome, which is far more common in the population, it is a, sometimes has the similar symptoms of diarrhea and abdominal pain. But in irritable bowel syndrome, you do not see any ulcers or ulcerations on colonoscopy. You do not see any elevations in inflammatory markers in the blood or stool. And IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is considered what is a, a functional disorder in GI compared to IBD, which follows more into the autoimmune umbrella of disorders. Okay, so with that sort of... Um, one second. There we go. So IBD is actually generally well researched in terms of large clinical trials for medications. But as far as women are concerned, like much of what we're going to hear today, uh, there is not much information out there, especially when it comes to pregnancy. Now, we do have some statistics um, based out of Europe where they do have national health systems. I'm going in and meeting everyone. Sorry, uh, where we do have statistics from national health systems in Europe, Canada, that do show that people who have IBD, um, especially if they flare during pregnancy, do have an increased risk of adverse outcomes. However, in the US, as you know, we do not have a national health system. There may be, um, to put it mildly, some inconsistencies in access to care. And in general, practice patterns do differ variably from people who are in academic IBD versus those in the general gastroenterology population. So for all of this, we really do have a lack of good information on how patients with IBD do in the US. Um, we have one registry that is a national registry called Piano that's based out of UCSF. And while it's a great first step, most of the data that is in that registry comes from um, patient self-reported outcomes. So as you can imagine, that um, we need a, a better way to have some higher quality data. So fortunately at Cedars, we happen to be one of the largest IBD centers in the world. And we also have a phenomenal obstetrics department, large volume of delivery of almost 7,000 births a year. And on top of that, Cedars has done a great job of being ahead of the curve when it comes to an electronic medical record system. So therefore, we are in a unique position at our institution to get reliable, verifiable, in-depth clinical information. And we have it down to histology and colonoscopies and from a maternal fetal side down to the velocity of blood flow and umbilical artery in the fetus. So we have lots of great information at Cedars. One other thing that I want to kind of um, talk about is that at Cedars, we, for the last 20 years in the IBD Center, predominantly with the with Dr. Targan, um, we have developed a large IBD biorepository named Myriad. And I'll go a little bit more into detail about that in a second. But previously, my colleagues here have shown that there are several serologic and genetic markers that are associated with IBD. And in some instances, we can perhaps anticipate a particular outcome based on the serologic and um, uh, genetic markers. So for the interest of time, I'm gonna move in forward a little bit, but I want to say that we don't have any idea, are these markers different in people who have different outcomes in pregnancy? Um, so that's one of the main aims of this study. So our hypothesis is that IBD patients who develop adverse disease or pregnancy outcomes will differ in clinical serologic or genetic markers compared to those who do not develop these adverse outcomes. So our particular aims, I'll go over, our specific aim one is to look for any genetic and serological predictors. And in this lecture, I'm going to, or this uh, presentation, I'm going to focus on um, patients who flare during pregnancy versus patients who do not flare during pregnancy. So aim one is, are there any genetic and serologic predictors? Aim two is to identify any demographic or clinical predictors. And aim three is to do an integrated predictive model for these adverse disease outcomes. So... To aim one, how do we you know, address this? So again, to go back, the Myriad Biobank that we have at Cedars has been going on for 20 plus years. Every patient that comes to our center as an initial visit will get asked if they want to be part of our Myriad Biobank uh, repository. So we have a wide variety uh, and rich data from clinical history. We also are able to draw um, blood to evaluate for serologies and if, if several other things. And then it's also genetic swabs. So we have been doing this for 20 plus, or almost 20 years at this point. And um, our last check, we have over 15,000 patients, over 100,000 um, samples that are banked and um, quite a bit of data from molecular data points now. So this has already been sort of in process here. 
So that is how we're going to attempt to do AIM-1. AIM-2 is more of a traditional uh, cross-sectional study. So this required hundreds of hours of detailed painstaking chart reviews to be able to go into our electronic medical record to get all these demographic clinical and IBD outcomes and OB outcome sectors. So how do we build our Magnolia cohort? So we have the 15,000 plus patients in Myriad, which is from the IBD center, which has the genetic and serologic and clinical data as well. And then we actually also have a very robust OB data repository from the OBGYN um, department. This has been going on um, for about the last decade or so that we have data from there. It involves at least 42,000 patients of clean data. So you would think when you sort of merge these two together, we would have very large volume. And I, I want to say we had about 122 of you So you may say, why is it so little? But you really have to keep in mind that the quality of this, how it's possible that 122 is that they have to have IBD. They have to be taken care of in our IBD care in Cedars. They have to have delivered at Cedar Sinai. They have to already be previously enrolled in Myriad and have blood and genetic data available. So it's actually quite um, a lot of criteria to that are very strict to be able to be in our cohort for Magnolia. Now, with that being said, um, you know the data that we have is so rich from this study that no one else really can sort of attempt to do this because they don't have the IBD center volume and they don't have the uh, volume from, you know, deliveries here. So as we already mentioned, we are also part of a um, multidisciplinary clinic. So this cohort was to be established now and then we will continue to grow it as we go through in the future. So let's just look a little bit at the characteristics of the cohort as a whole. So the age of diagnosis for all the patients in the cohort is 22. They're about two thirds Crohn's to one third UC. Um, about 40% uh, are either on a biologic or a combination of a biologic, and about a quarter have had some sort of IBD surgery. Now, I will say this probably does differ a little bit from the general population that we see because we do see we are a tertiary or quaternary referral center for IBD. So, as far as the OB um, demographics of the entire cohort, the average age of delivery is 33, which is in line with what we see at Cedars in general, a slightly older population. Um, mode of delivery is cesarean is quite high, even more so than our usual rate of delivery at Cedars. And we can, if we have time, we can go into that a little bit later. Um, a little over half are, it's their first baby. BMI is 28, the gestational age on average is 38. So a little lower than, uh, or a little sooner than expected. GBS positivity of 16%. And then as far as the pregnancy outcomes of the entire cohort, you know, one thing I wanted to kind of point out is that most of this is maybe around where we would see, but a little a couple that are perhaps a little different. Gestational diabetes is a little bit lower in our particular cohort. Um, uh, and some of the really severe sort of outcomes are a little lower in our cohort. Part of that is probably we monitor them very closely. Um, now, how about the neonatal uh, outcomes of the entire cohort? Uh, about a little over half are male. Um, there were about 14% that required some NICU admissions. As far as genetic anomalies, um, death, things like that, they're actually quite low in our population. Um, and about 6% were small for gestational age. So how about the entire cohort? About a third flared during their pregnancy. And about half of those that flared had their flare controlled by the time of delivery. The type of medications that were used for it were a combination of um, 5-ASA medications, biologics, as well as most common steroids. So let's look at, parse out, what happens to women who flare during their pregnancy compared to women who do not flare during their pregnancy? So as far as the mode of delivery, gestational age delivery, GPS positive, there was no difference between the two. How about some of the other um, outcomes? So we do see a slightly higher rate of uh, PPROM, and we do see um, a little bit less estimated blood loss, but everything else uh, for the most part was the same between the two. Um, as far as other outcomes, there was a trend or that was statistically significant for small for gestational age and those who flared during pregnancy. And then now to move on to, can we predict who will flare? So, Plus, on clinical factors for predicting for IBD flares, age did not seem to matter. One interesting thing that we did find is that, you know, I think all of us who do some sort of autoimmune have always been thought a third of people flare, a third of people say about the same, and a third of people get better. But when you really parse out between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, that actually is not the case. So ulcerative colitis patients 
they, in our cohort, they tended to flare about half the time compared with Crohn's disease, which for the most part, uh, tended to flare less than expected. So I think that as a whole, when we look at IBD practices, we are very, very, um, you know, I don't say like on top of treatment for Crohn's disease because it's thought to be you know generally more challenging to treat people with uh, Crohn's disease. But we have to kind of take a step back and say the ulcerophytis patient who is just on very minimal non-immunosuppressive medication, we have to be just as equally careful and express that to the patient to be just as careful during their pregnancy as the patient who has Crohn's disease who's had five surgeries and is on multiple medications. The other thing I wanted to point out is that calprotectin, which we use uniquely in IBD as a measure of internal intestinal inflammation, was actually quite predictive of, um, or was very reflective of a flare, a flare during pregnancy. So how about other, how about medications? So it did seem to be that if you were on good combination therapy, um, that, you know, you, you tended to have really no, or less flares, whereas those on steroids, you're sort of self-selecting for that, but uh, pretty much always flared. And then how about this is we, what we stress. So we stress to patients that their best chance of having a good outcome is if they are in endoscopic remission prior to pregnancy, which is we look inside and you do not have ulcerations. You look fairly close to normal on the inside, if not normal. And we have shown in our cohort that that is the case. Those who are endoscopic remission prior to pregnancy and those who are at least in clinical remission, which is I feel good, also have a lower rate of flaring. So then let's go to see now that we've sort of completed AIM-2, let's take a step back and take a look at AIM-1. What about genetic and serologic predictors? Well, I don't know if you guys know what happened in 2020, but the world did take a bit of a pause. Um, I don't think when we got this grant, we anticipated there would be a global pandemic. So what happened is essentially is that we have some limited data, but unfortunately I don't have everything to show you. Like everybody else's lab at Cedars, our IBD lab um, was shut down uh, temporarily in, in March. It is reopening back up, but we took the opportunity to upgrade the Myriad Systems databases. So that is in the process of doing that, um, completing this month. So I will have more data to show you, but I wanna share with you what data we did have prior to this all happening. So we do have some limited serologic um, data. And for the interest of time, I won't go into too much about each single one, but essentially there are five um, serologies that have been well studied in IBD. So ASCAs, OMC, CBER tend to happen more in patients with Crohn's disease. INCAs tend to happen more in patients with ulcerative colitis. In some, um, although they're not 100% on, on either end. So we have seen some studies that some of these various serologies can be helpful in predicting various outcomes, such as pouchitis per se. Um, but we don't have any idea if these serologies may be useful in, in helping uh, identify any differences during pregnancy. So we have some limited data, about a third of the cohort on their serologies. And we did find that none of these are statistically significant, but there is a trend towards um, lower ASCAs in patients who, who flared um, uh, as well. So that's so far the IBD serology that we have. With that limited amount of data, we did try to complete AIM-3, which is to come up with a predictive model. And let's just kind of see where we're at at this point. So if you use just serology only, actually, to be perfectly honest, um, with just serologic data, the model had an accuracy of 80% uh, predicting of if you're going to flare or not flare. So I was actually pleasantly surprised by that. Um, but uh, some caveats to that in a second. Clinical only was actually quite um, significant. So Clinical does include things like endoscopic remission prior to. So we this is having good quality data that shows that they are um, their colonoscopies are normal. Um, and then if you combine the two, the accuracy of the model had 90% accuracy. Now, um, these are their R squared and the goodness of fit. So you can kind of take a look for yourself for this. Uh, like I said, this is very pre preliminary with a limited amount of serologic data. So um, we are hoping for a more robust model as we move forward to finish out. Um, the rest of the serologic data and adding the genetic as well. So to summarize our findings, cesarean rates for IBD patients higher than national hospital average. Um, also required patients had a higher rates of pregnancy flares. Elevated fecal calprotectin was helpful based on a combination, being on a combination therapy, clinical endoscopic remission was associated with less flares during pregnancy. Small for gestational age and PPROM were associated with IBD flares. And there may be a role for serologies to assist in prediction of flares. Now we have, as I said, this is um, this grant was so um, 
important for us because it gave us the time to start to set up this cohort and to have the time to do this properly from the get-go so that we can um, go forward and not just expand on the numbers of patients, but also to be able to answer the serology and genetics like we talked about, but talk about well, what happens in the postpartum period when essentially hormonal changes shifts the other way. What about breastfeeding? Does that have some sort of protective effect in the future for a prior, uh, subsequent pregnancy? And also we have these detailed ultrasound reports and that we're able to see, can we see even on ultrasound the effect that a flare is having on a baby, um, even if before uh, perhaps you're able to uh, clinically see it. So we have lots of things that we are very excited to be able to do in the future, all thanks to this grant. So again, thank you so much for the William H. Donner Foundation, for Cruz, for our Magnolia team, also for the OB department and Myriad who very much helped us along this whole process. And I'm, I'm happy to take any, any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalo. That was great. We're going to hold questions until after Dr. Medeiros and Lawrenson, but I do want to point out uh, Virginia Roosevelt is now on. I don't think you were on quite at the beginning. We thanked you, but we do thank you very much uh, for uh, your support of Cruz and the several grants that you've been able to support. So we really very much appreciate uh, you and the William H. Donner Foundation. So thank you. So we're going to move on to our, our, this is our second grant that was supported by the Louis B. Mayer Foundation. And um, the two researchers, Dr. Lawrence and Dr. Medeiros, are both going to be part of the presentation. Dr. Medeiros is an associate professor of pathology and director of gynecologic pathology here at Cedar sinai Her research focus on is on molecular pathogenesis and diagnosis of gynecologic tumors and related conditions. And Dr. Kate Lawrenson is an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology and biomedical sciences and is the co-director of the Women's Cancer Research Program and associate director of the Cedar sinai Postdoctoral Scientist Program. Her laboratory here in the Department of OBGYN researches mechanisms of gene regulation in normal and diseased gynecologic tissues. And we will move on to our second different topic, and they will be talking about endometrial cancer. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting us to speak uh, today about our project on uh, master transcription factors uh, expression in endometrial cancer. I will be presenting part of the talk and Dr. Larson uh, some other slides. So endometrial cancer is the most common gynecologic malignancy in developed countries uh, with estimated 65,000 new cases and 12,000 uh, deaths in the United States in two, estimated in 2000 on 2020. As we can see uh, from this graph here, uh, from this year data, the incidence of uh, uterine cancer is slightly increasing, while uh, the mortality has not uh, changed significantly in the past three years. Overall, the prognosis uh, for endometrial cancer is good, uh, with a five-year relative survival of greater than 80%. However, 15, about 15% 15 of patients uh, who present with stage 1 disease recur or metastasize, and uh, the prognosis for this case is poor, with a median survival of only 12 months. Histologic subtype and grade uh, and surgical staining, uh, staging remain the strongest prognostic indicators for endometrial cancer and guide treatment. This is a uh, table I extracted from a review uh, paper, a recent, relatively recent review paper on treatment of uh, endometrial carcinoma. However, there are no targeted therapies uh, for endometrial cancer beyond hormonal therapy in some cases. And uh, none of those particularly address recurrent or metastatic disease. Therefore, there is uh, truly an urgent need for new therapeutic targets. A molecular classification for endometrial cancer emerged in the last few, uh, five years, and it was based on TCGA data. Uh, Endometrioid uh, carcinomas, which are most commonly low-grade, fall in the, the categories of pole mutated, uh, pole hypermutated, MSI hypermutated, and copy number low. Uh, 
And uh, those tend to have the best prognosis, while serious carcinomas uh, in a small proportion of high-grade endometrioid carcinomas uh, have a worse prognosis. This classification, however, does not provide a deep understanding of the disease drivers. It also does not predict the development of recurrence or metastasis, particularly in low-grade endometrial carcinomas. And most importantly, it does not offer great potential for the development of new tar uh, therapeutic, targeted therapeutic um, targets. I'm oh, sorry, new therapeutic targets. Now I'm going to pass on to Dr. Larson. Thank you, Dr. Medeiros. Um, so, in my lab, we're very interested in a subset of proteins in the cell called transcription factors um, and a subset of transcription, transcription factors that we term the master transcription factors. Um, and these are so interesting to us because they have this incredible power to reprogram one cell into a completely different cell type. So, with a small collection of three, four, five master transcription factors, um, a cell can differentiate in it into a completely different identity. Um, what we see is that these master transcription factors get hijacked during cancer development um, and they, they confer many properties of a cancer, such as the ability to replicate um, without limit. And what we also see, though, is that cancers often become addicted to these transcriptional oncogenes. And so this also offers great therapeutic opportunity because when you withdraw or inhibit these tr master transcription factors, it's catastrophic for the cell. And so we are really interested in ways to identify and characterize these potent cellular vul vulnerabilities in multiple cancers, but in this case, endometrial cancer. Um, the discovery is quite challenging. Um, typically, people have used epigenomic profiling, but that's only available for a, a few cancer types and not available for endometrial cancer, for example. Um, and so we developed a novel approach, which we call the Cancer Core Transcription Factor Specificity or CACTUS algorithm, where we would leverage the TCGA large multi-cancer cohort to identify candidate transcription factors based on the patterns of their expression across all of these different cancer types. And so we identify factors that are very highly expressed in a cancer specific way. And we were able to show that these small collections of factors are highly enriched for master TFs across multiple tumor types. Um, and so we did the predictions across 34 tumor types, 104 molecular and histologic subtypes. This shows that the collection of candidates across gynecologic cancers stratified by the molecular and or histologic subtypes that are reported to have prognostic um, associations in TCJ studies. Um, the darker the purple shows the increased frequency that a, a target is identified. And what we tend to see is that um, we have certain candidates come up across multiple organs that might share a more distant, common developmental origin. And so SOC17, MECOM and PAX8 are three such factors that come up across multiple adenocarcinomas um, across the uterus, cervix and ovary. Um, we also see some factors that are associated with the subgroups that we know have worse, worse prognoses. So, for example, in uterus, we were interested to look at TED4 and MISE1, which came up in the um, copy number high group, but not in some of the other um, groups that have better outcomes. Um, and so we had been interested in using ovarian cancer as a proof of concept for the discovery of these three factors which potentially have pan-gynecologic functions and could potentially be therapeutic targets across multiple gynecologic tumor types. And so first we asked if these factors coincide with super enhancers. So this is a molecular property that should be enriched across master transcription factors. So that hockey stick plot on the left shows when we ran all of these active regions in the genome, um, do we see enrichment of these master TFs at the most active regions? And in fact, that is the case. 
some of the largest regions of high chromatin activity coincide with our master TFs in ovarian cancer. Um, we then wanted to evaluate the therapeutic potential of these targets. So we used in vitro methods to deplete the level of PAX8, SOX17 or MECOM in ovarian cancer models. And we could see within a short space of time, we had a very rapid effect on cell viability and it became um, all of the cell, the cell quality information was reduced by at least 50% across each of those um, individual factor knockdowns. And so summary, um, using this multi-cancer approach, we can efficiently prioritize cancer MTFs. So we've identified PAX8, SOX17 and MECOM as candidate MTFs across high-grade serious ovarian cancer, but also other gynecologic cancer types, including uterine. And we've also created a set of candidate factors that we think are associated with the more aggressive uterine cancers that we want to explore in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Now I'm going to be presenting this project itself. Uh, our hypothesis is that particular MTFs play essential roles in the development of um, both primary recurrent and metastatic endometrial carcinomas. And uh, we aim to determine which of these master transcription factors are highly expressed in endometrial carcinoma and to characterize their expression level per histologic subtype, histologic grade, and staging. We also would like to distinguish the expression profiles of highly expressed MTFs in primary versus recurrent and versus metastatic carcinoma, endometrial carcinoma. Uh, these studies will consist of these uh, steps outlined here. I'll briefly go over each one of them. First, uh, we performed a search uh, for patients that were treated at CEDARS for endometrial carcinoma, only of the endometrioid type and only the ones that either recurred or metastasized on this first phase of the study. Uh, our initial search uh, revealed almost 2,000 cases of endometrial carcinomas that were treated at CEDARS between 1999 and 2019. Of this total, we narrowed down to 133 specimens from 68 patients that were treated for advanced stage endometrial carcinoma here at CEDARS. Uh, the breakup is 13 patients uh, with extra uterine disease at time of initial presentation here. 15 patients are uh, presented at CEDARS with metastatic disease after being previously diagnosed with a primary endometrial cancer elsewhere. And 40 patients had both the initial diagnosis here and the diagnosis of uh, disease spread here at CEDARS. We then retrieved our, archi our archival slides and revealed all those slides on this 113 sp uh, 133 specimens, uh, first in order to confirm the histologic grade and subtype, uh, but also most important to, to select the most representative paraffin block. And then we circled the most representative area of the tumor uh, on the AGE slides and sent all the blocks to the Biobank and Translational uh, Research Core uh, for the construction of the tissue microarrays. This is one of our blocks uh, here uh, that is already being constructed. We are going to be using one millimeter tumor cores in triplicates and plus controls. So the yellow and, and green are controls and, and the others are, are our cases. Uh, we have select SOX17 and MECOM as our initial targets based on the preliminary data that Kate just presented. Uh, we also have already optimized these two antibodies and also have optimized the immunohistochemical conditions. I have outlined that here, but of course I will not be going in too much detail. Uh, we are now uh, developing a scoring system uh, for the immunostains that will take into account the proportion of tumor cells staining positively, positively for these markers, plus the intensity of staining. Uh, and then uh, once we have the scoring ready, we'll test with associ uh, of associations of the master transcription factor expression per carcinoma grade subtype, uh, why, if, either if it's primary, recurrent, or metastatic, among other variables. Oh,
Uh, just for some, for some future directions, we do intend to continue our investigation later on uh, using advanced molecular techniques, uh, ultimately with the aim of evaluating the potential of this master for transcription factors and their partners uh, for target therapy. Uh, we are very grateful uh, to the Louis Meyer Foundation for funding this project. Uh, we would also like to thank the team and collaborators that generated the preliminary master transcription factor data and the Biobank and Translational Research Core. A uh, special thank to Elias, who is one of our residents here in pathology, who did uh, a lot of work in uh, the case selection. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, Thank you. Uh, and we look forward to hearing more about your results as you get them. Um, I really appreciate that. We have time for a couple questions and I'll start one, one for Dr. Banthala. So Dr. Banthala, based on what you guys, what your team has found, how would this change uh, your counseling for pregnant women or women planning pregnancy with respect to your data? Thank you for that question. And, you know, so I think that this helps to show that some of the adverse outcomes that we are seeing in sort of a larger data set in Europe are actually transferable over to us. We're finding the same adverse pregnancy outcomes. I think that people always have this conception when it comes to pregnancy that as long as I'm feeling okay and don't harm, uh, I can handle anything, but my baby, I want to protect them. I don't want to be on any medications that makes them, you know, uh, maybe more potentially have problems. So I think this kind of reinforces that, no, the best way to protect your baby and your, you know, uh, the outcome of your pregnancy is really to take good care of yourself first and foremost. So making sure that you are in clinical and endoscopic remission prior to conceiving, making sure that you follow up very carefully during pregnancy. So I think this data gives us, especially at Cedars, to all of our patients, we can say, look, we have very good data that shows that your pregnancy outcomes are improved if we do great preconception counseling, follow them very carefully, and have this coordinated message between the gastroenterologist, the maternal fetal medicine specialist, and the OBGYN so that we're all on the same page. So I think this data shows at Cedars that we can have, we can point to that if we do all of these things correctly, then hopefully the pregnancy outcome is, uh, is favorable. Great, thank you. And does anyone else have a question for Dr. Lawrence or Madeiras? Because I have one if no one else has one, but I don't have to be the only one talking. So, um, yeah, go ahead. I, I just wonder. I'm sorry, we, we can't hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I keep getting muted. I'm wondering if second or third pregnancy is worse than first. That's for Dr. Benthala. Yes. Excellent question. I don't have enough data to answer those. Anecdotally, it seems to be that they seem to follow the same trend. But the things that we have to be really careful of is that um, we don't overinterpret uh, what that means for any particular patient. So we still counsel them the same, which is to make sure that between pregnancies, you are well controlled before embarking on another pregnancy. Great, thank you. So I, we have time for one more question. So it's going to be me. So to Dr. Medeiros or, or Lawrence, if I were a patient with endometrial cancer, why should I care about your work? Well, I think if you fall into the 80% that is cured by surgery, it wouldn't, this type of work would not be necessary. But if you were one of the patients that presented with metastatic or recurrent disease or developed it later on, this work would be very significant because there are no treatment, like there are no effective treatment options at this time. And this is what we plan to offer some molecular data that will help develop this type of therapies for, for recurrent and metastatic endometrial cancer. That's great. Thank you very much. Well, both of all, both teams did a great job and we, we really enjoyed hearing it. So Thanks I'm for gonna, having us. I'm going to turn uh, the show, so to speak, over to Dr. Jeffries. Hi, Dr. Kilpatrick. Just. Okay, so now from last year's winners and then to this year's winners. Um, 
And first, I'd just like to say on behalf of the Crew Steering Committee, thanks to the William H. Donner Foundation again for supporting um, these awards, and also secondly to Cedar Sinai and um, for supporting the awards as well, the Re Clinical Research, the Research Institute here. Um, and this has allowed us to award four grants this year from an outstanding field of applicants. Each will receive $30,000 to investigate sex differences in, a disease, in the disease process, particularly with respect to impacts on women's health, um, as um, our awards always do. So they were all evaluated based on innovation, their ability to impact um, women's health, and then also the likelihood of achieving further um, funding. So first up is um, Dr. Gana Chamarka's project, and she's from my own group, and she is looking at how responses to UV light differ between men and women, and how that impacts the autoimmune disease lupus, and particularly flares in lupus, and lupus is a disease that affects predominantly women. Um, so this is, a, this is potentially a very important um, study for understanding exposure to UV light and how that impacts disease. Secondly, um, Dr. Ali Moser and Ty Svensson are going to look at how um, disease variant and how APOE variants, which is a disease that is in, associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease in women, um, how basically exposure to heavy metals in the environment um, can impact the, that disease and whether um, men and women who harbor this particular APOE variant have differences in their response to heavy metals. And they're going to use um, iPSCs, which are inducible um, pluripotent stem cells, which we heard a lot about from the first talk, um, from men and women with these different genetic variants, and look at the responses to heavy metals. Thirdly, um, we have Dr. Melody Metzger and her team, and they're going to look at the risk of um, ACL injury in women. And female athletes have a 10 times greater risk of ACL injury compared to um, men trained similarly in the similar sport. Um, and they're going to investigate the hypothesis that um, oral contraceptives contribute to this increased risk in women and um, by their ability to suppress the hormone um, relaxin. And so this could potentially um, give some indication as to why women are more at risk of developing ACL than men. And finally, last but not least, and these grants are the, the um, summaries of these grants, grants are not given in any particular order. And um, Dr. Report um, in, is going to investigate whether um, inflammatory protein signatures that are found in the blood can predict how um, women um, are affected with perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And Women are like uh, there's probably 10 to 20 percent, and I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, of women who are um, can be affected with perinatal natal mood disorders. And um, so this is potentially going to shed light not only on mechanisms that give rise to these this disorder, but also provide some indication of um, biomarkers that we might use to predict who is going to be affected. So we. So basically, um, good luck to everybody with their um, projects. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from you all next year and you're coming forward with your research. And you know, you can see from the depth and breadth of the research that there's a lot of different, there's a lot of research going on here, Women's Health in Cedars. Um, and through um, these pilot grants, we're hoping to um, springboard some of this research to get um, greater funding um, for women's health research in, in um, Cedars. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jeffries. Um, we're scheduled for a break, but I think I'm just going to move ahead. I want to make, I, I don't know what's echoing. Somebody is echoing. Um, okay, so um, I, I do want to make one comment, which I think is important for all of us who are interested in more women, research on women's health. Another thing each of us can do is um, volunteer for studies. So if women don't volunteer for research studies, we don't, we can't uh, learn from them and we need a wide variety of women. And the other thing we can do is we can agree to have our, our uh, information um, put into registries. You've heard about two registries so far this morning um, and there are more out there and just agreeing it, it's, it, they can take off the identifiers, but just agreeing to have your healthcare information or samples 
put into registries is what can really fuel research that we need. So that, that will help all women in the future. Anyway, um, I think we should just move on and I'm going to turn it over to Tom Cagle, but it's not really Tom Cagle. It is, it, it is Nicole Leonard who always comes up as Tom, Tom Cagle, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Here we go. It's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Wong. Dr. Melissa Wong is faculty in maternal fetal medicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Beyond clinical work, her interests include medical education, informatics, and health system science. She completed a medical education fellowship program and has a master's in health delivery science. Dr. Wong has presented original research at multiple national meetings. Her research interests include maternal morbidity, disparities in care, artificial intelligence in, and informatic solutions to address adverse maternal outcomes. She recently received an SMFM award for the work she will present today on using virtual reality in laboring with women. Welcome, Dr. Wong. Yeah, I'll get myself, I'm not as fast on the draw on the muting, muting and unmuting, but um, so just confirming you guys can see and hear okay. Wonderful. All right. So I'll thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and I'm really honored to speak uh, to everybody regarding something a little bit different, uh, virtual reality um, in labor. So um, I think for any new technology, we'll want to really go through these questions, which are sort of why does it matter? How does VR fit um, into labor? And then really, you know, take a little tour of what else is happening in VR. So I'll start by uh, trying to answer the question of why it matters. And I always say that I do this from the place of being very smart and not, uh, you know, ever having a labor contraction, because it turns out labor hurts. So one of this, uh, the earlier published studies quantifying just how much labor hurt um, actually was done on 144 44 women out of Montreal General. And on the McGill pain score, Dr. Melzak found that labor pain was right on par with having a finger amputated. Ouch. So <laughs> on the other hand, um, so Perhaps there's no really better evidence, though, of how much labor hurts than really what we end up doing about the pain. So if we just look at the national numbers, about 73.1% of women will have an epidural during labor with much higher rates among first timers. And interestingly for me, if there's really one thing I realized while putting together this uh, study and entering this space, it's that though women have pain in labor, they are also always seeking alternatives to um, doing anything about that pain. So I already told you that women are overall, three fourths of them will eventually get an epidural, but nonetheless, you can see just from a highly scientific baby center query that there were 376,000 results just for the term avoid epidural. And not only do they sort of aspire to avoid an epidural, they really put those thoughts into action. So this is our most comprehensive data on women using complementary and alternative medications during labor um, out of Australia. And what they found was that 73% of women use some version of complementary or alternative medication during their pregnancy. So uh, wanting something else is tremendously prevalent. So then as we think about adding VR to the panoply of things, quite frankly, that women have tried or been sold to manage their labor pain from things that don't work at all, like analgesia, um, aromatherapy, which as somebody who's there for the pushing stage a lot uh, was a little disappointing, but aromatherapy sadly is mostly placebo um, or biofeedback to things that kind of work like TENS, massage, or acupressure, although it's hard to really imagine something that massage wouldn't improve, to things that really do work like hypnobirthing, acupuncture, or water births, it's really critical that we legitimately evaluate whether virtual reality is actually useful um, before we bring it to the labor floor. So how might it fit into, the la into labor? So for the un uninitiated, sometimes I've titled this talk VR and they think she must not mean that VR, but no. I mean that VR. So virtual reality is defined as the computer generated simulation of a 3D imager environment that can be interacted with in a seemingly real or physical way. And so certainly while many of us think of VR as just relevant for a teenager wanting to level up their zombie gaming experience, it in fact does actually have several applications in healthcare, including in patient and medical education in advanced imaging and where I'm going to focus uh, my research, which was on therapeutic virtual reality. So VR has been used therapeutically for decades in really a number of domains, including treatment of anxiety and mood disorders, um, as well as a, co a component of neuro rehab. So for their physical therapy, essentially putting on a VR headset will actually cause them to improve faster. Um, and then for both acute and chronic pain, so much so that there have been meta-analyses that consistently show a positive effect. But surely 
labor is different? Well, I would actually make the case that as we, even as we know and understand the sort of standard physiology and neurologic changes that happen during labor pain, we also know that one of the strongest predictors of whether a woman is going to receive an epidural is actually whether she planned to have an epidural in the first place, suggesting that as women basically can control some degree of this, that um, labor might be a particularly ideal target. VR for pain in general is postulated to work via a combination of distraction, um, as well as uh, acceleration of interval time and actual literal obliteration of pain signals has been shown in functional MRI data, all of which suggests a physiologic basis for its potential utility in labor. There was really only one previous study that ever looked um, at this question, the Varel study, in which they showed women in labor a generic underwater scene and played some relaxing Celtic music in the background. What they were able to show actually was a reduction in pain intensity, as well as less time spent thinking about the pain, and that the overall unpleasantness of the pain was much less. Which I always think is particularly impressive given what they were looking at, because this is where I really think you have to focus group this question, because you take a woman in labor and try to calm her down by dunking her underwater and showing her a manatee, that doesn't exactly strike me as something um, actively helping a woman in labor. So in any case, we naturally thought, I think we can do a little better um, and performed a randomized controlled trial on using VR in labor. So our design, um, as I said, was an RCT conducted as a pragmatic design, meaning that whatever they were already doing, uh, they didn't have to stop. So if they were indulging in aromatherapy or massage, I'll go for it. All patients did a series of pre-intervention questionnaires, including a childbirth self-efficacy inventory, um, as well as a promise score. And then the patients were essentially randomized, half of them to getting virtual reality and half to getting no intervention. Throughout the intervention, maternal vitals and the fetal heart rate were and contraction monitor were being assessed. And then following the intervention, pain scores and vitals were reassessed for both. Additionally, those in the VR arm took a qualitative survey and which we uh, just recently analyzed now. So the particular VR intervention that we used was actually a visualization called Labor Bliss. And it was designed by an outside company in conjunction with a doula. And what made the intervention particularly unique was not only the relaxing visualization, but also what was actually coming through the headphones. So the patient, for example, actually heard messages pertinent to a woman in labor. She might hear, for example, contractions are waves of energy and love that bring your baby to you, which is perhaps not quite how I as an MFM would describe contractions. Nobody wanted to hear about calcium cell modulin during labor, but that's probably why they didn't ask an MFM to generate their auditory script. So now on to, so now on to our results. So our primary outcome um, was actually a difference in differences, um, or in other words, oh, the actual delta in pain scores between pre and post intervention pain scores here shown for one patient who went, for example, from five to seven. So what we found was that looking at each individual patient in our control arm then, what is apparent is that doing nothing to a woman in labor over the course of 30 minutes, particularly when she gets to a pain score four to seven, her labor pain tends to stay the same or get worse and in fact, none improved. By contrast, in the virtual reality arm, while some did experience the same or worse pain, many, uh, uh, many also experienced significant reductions in their pain scores, um, including this subject and the last there who kind of goes all the way from nails digging into the bed rails to a pain score of zero because she was asleep. So putting these numbers then in sort of summative terms, the control arm overall saw an increase in their pain by 0.58, the VR arm a reduction in their pain by 0.52, and the difference in these two differences was statistically significant. Other pain-related outcomes um, between the groups are relatively similar, including long-term pain scores, which makes sense for such a short intervention. Um, but on the other hand, um, some during intervention assessments, including post-intervention heart rate, um, actually did differ um, with it being lower in the VR group, so suggesting some biologic plausibility there. So in summary, our objective was to evaluate whether VR was effective, and we concluded that it was effective in reducing pain for labor and women. Our next steps would be to analyze the data um, gathered for the qualitative portion, which we just completed, um, as well as to design a future trial for continued access um, during labor and delivery itself. Uh, there is always room to further optimize the labor-specific visualizations, as well as with breathing-based biofeedback, and then also to explore other utilities and pregnancies. And so that's really it in terms of what's been published for therapeutic VR in pregnancy. Um, but I'd like to also then actually look at what else is out there and consider some of the areas I discussed earlier, starting with patient education. 
So I'll say that my favorite example from patient education is actually out of Stanford, uh, which I thought was genuinely an approach where VR improved patient education. So there's a bunch of sort of hokey things out there, you know, look at your baby spin it around, but this was really relevant. So Stanford has a really robust fetal therapy program, and they developed a VR simulation to better explain to patients what happens in a solemnization procedure for twin-twin transfusion syndrome. Essentially, this is when one twin is sort of getting excess and the other twin is getting under blood flow. Um, and what happens is that a fetoscope is inserted through the uterus, through the sac, and then a laser is introduced to photocoagulate the problematic anastomoses. So this program actually allowed you as a patient to be handed a headset and controller and actually be surrounded by that physiology and see the physiologic changes yourself, as well as sort of quote unquote perform the laser photocoagulation, which I would suggest is quite a different experience than reading handouts or watching a video. I'll move on now actually to the burgeoning field of medical education in VR. And this field is particularly developed, I'll say outside of OB. And in fact, just across the way, children's, they're actually required to simulate pediatric emergencies in VR before they ever touch a patient. To find examples in OB simulation, we have to go a little bit further across the pond and actually all the way to Australia, where they're training midwives on pelvic anatomy using VR. I think that most of us who um, you know, deliver babies would have envisioned the high fidelity simulators would at least be ideal. But I think the ability to really um, enter the anatomy and understand what's happening in the systems and cognitively can be helpful. I'll move on now actually to imaging. And so whenever I think about what VR can do for imaging, I sometimes describe it as a little bit like 3D plus. So this is actually a really interesting example in uh, conjoined twin pregnancies. Um, and th in these pregnancies in particular, it's really critical to understand what is and is not connected um, between the fetuses. Um, because we can then identify which anomalies um, would be considered lethal. So in this case, one team of experts was given 2D and 3D imaging, and a whole separate team of experts um, was given the virtual reality um, images. And what they found is that those given VR images were able to more, more accurately identify a fourth arm, an abdominal defect, an abnormal ulnar deviation, um, as well as severe scoliosis, none of which were able to be seen on 2D or 3D imaging. In a subsequent paper, they showed essentially an increase from 65 to 75% of diagnosing congenital anomalies correct, correctly. And this is another example of sort of bridging the imaging slash patient education piece, um, which is already being studied right now using MRI imaging of cardiac defects to help patients really see the actual defect in place and where any of those backups could um, then contribute to the pathophysiology that they're being counseled on. And last, we're going to swing all the way back to what began this talk, or um, therapeutic VR. So one example of how uh, a procedural use of sort of for acute pain is back in Australia, actually, at Monash Medical Center. There, they're doing a trial of external cephalic version, which is a procedure essentially to flip a baby from breech to uh, cephalic, and is uncomfortable. I'll say that one of my patients once said, wow, doc, they don't give those away in raffles, do they? So relatively uncomfortable. And their primary interest was to see whether ECB could impact pain scores. And you can see that while she's experiencing um, this discomfort, um, she is relatively oblivious to it, sort of in this world of Chinese lanterns through an immersive app um, called Skylights. So skipping ahead now um, to my last example of how VR is currently being used, which is actually in the postpartum period, um, or the fourth trimester, as we like to call it. So perhaps some of the most exciting developments are actually around breastfeeding or in in this case, breast pumping. So um, I'll introduce you, this is Pinar, and Pinar is a PhD computer scientist working at MIT in artificial intelligence. She's very impressive in her own right until of course she met her match in Ada. Ada, who is her daughter, um, initially latched, but then of course lost the hang of it, leaving her in the oh so common quandary of pumping. And pumping um, sucks. So in the best case scenario, you're in your office or you're sort of trying to like hide in the corner of a lactation room or a bathroom. I'm um, trying to make things happen. So when the MIT hackathon had as its theme, uh, make the breast pump not suck, uh, Pinar and her team got to work on creating an immersive VR experience to make it not a little, not at least a little less. So you might ask yourself why VR for this? Well, because when it comes down to it, we know that pumping is very much sort of mentally driven and hormonally driven with milk supply volumetrically dependent on your frame of mind. So show a woman a picture of her child and she will literally make more milk, play relaxing music, more milk, and so they thought, why have to endure that office or, you know, shielded lactation room when you're having to pump? Why not instead, for example, be in your nursery with your dresser or your wallpaper or that weird grid number thing that all of us with kids have as standard issue 
So, or maybe even of an avatar of your baby looking back up at you. So it was really fascinating work and ended up winning a group prize at the MIT Hackathon. So that about wraps um, us up. I hope that you've come to understand why considering options for alternative pain managements might matter, how VR might fit into labor, um, and then finally had a taste of the current landscape of VR. So be it in patient education, medical education, advanced imaging, or therapeutic VR, the field only continues to gestate. I'd like to offer my tremendous thanks to the labor and delivery staff, nurses, residents, midwives, physicians, and all the patients who were gracious enough to participate in our study. And with special thanks to Dr. Spiegel and Gregory, my mentors on this project. And again, my thanks to the Cruise team for the opportunity to share our work. Thank you, Dr. Wong. That was a very interesting presentation. There's a um, question in the chat. Are there yeah. sex differences in VR um, as it relates to acceptance, response, or any outcome? That is that is a really fascinating question. And I'm relatively familiar, familiar with what's come out of um, Dr. Spiegel's lab and have not seen that looked at. So that seems uh, like a low hanging fruit. Um, <laughs> if anything, I will say that, you know, being the uh, study staff of one who consented all of these patients, um, I would get a pretty good uptake on women saying yes, but I would get 100% uptake from the partners saying yes, uh, which I had no interest in. But <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then another question about biomarkers of pain and contrasting them in VR um, versus placebo patients. We have not actually, this was very much um, clinical as well as using the um, vitals data. So um, we, we did actually continuously measure maternal um, heart rate, blood pressure, um, as well as the fetal um, heart rate and um, any fetal changes. So continuously assessing it on um, whether the fetus was feeling in distress. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Wong. That was great. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Parker, and she's going to introduce uh, Dr. Jones. Hello. So thank you. I'm really um, honored and excited to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Michelle Jones today. So Michelle came to us um, uh, originally from Western Australia. She came to Cedar sinai to join the research team of Dr. Arzi, and she's been working in the genetics of polycystic ovarian cyst syndrome uh, for that project. Um, she ultimately completed her PhD here at Cedar sinai and she continued to work from there in polycystic um, ovarian syndrome, um, but recently has switched into the study um, of high serious grade ovarian cancers. Um, and she's been working in the Center for Bioinformatics and Functional Genomics as a postdoctoral fellow, and then ultimately as faculty now. Um, and she works on genetic epidemiology and variant discovery. But really, she's been spearheading this large-scale multiomic project um, to profile both primary and recurrent ovarian cancer uh, tumors in women uh, from a very large uh, repository we're, we're really fortunate to have here. And I have the pleasure of working with Dr. Jones. Um, and in the proteomic arm of that work. And I know that ba just based on the discoveries and the progress that we're making in our small arm, that she's going to have um, some very interesting things to share with us today. So I'm excited to introduce her to you all um, and looking forward to hear what she has to say. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Sylvia, can you hear me okay if I instruct to advance? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm really excited to be here to speak to the Cruise Group. It's uh, a great opportunity. So I'm here to speak about a study we've been working on for a couple of years, and it's a large multiomic study focusing on high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And we're really trying to dig into the mechanisms of chemo resistance, which is one of the primary clinical challenges of this cancer. And I just want to say from the very get-go that this is a very collaborative project. We have multiple people involved. But the work I'm going to show today is really the result of uh, a team of three of us. It's Nicole Gull, who recently graduated with her PhD uh, just two months ago from the CEDARS program. Uh, the postdoc from my lab, Pei Chen Peng, I think she's here listening today, and myself. So the work I present is a collaborative effort from the three of us. Next slide, please. So ovarian cancer presents a really significant clinical challenge. Uh, it's the most lethal gynecologic on, um, gynecologic cancer. And when I refer to ovarian cancer from this point forward, I'm specifically referring to the most common subtype, which is called high-grade serous. It's very lethal. 
Uh, it's generally diagnosed at a late stage with extensive metastatic formation throughout the abdomen, and this really presents one of the primary problems. The treatment options have not really developed much over the last three decades. It's really cornered around an initial surgical debulking that occurs, and that's followed by rounds of platinum-based combination chemotherapy. Currently, um, taxanes are used frequently in combination with this platinum, and uh, recently there's been the addition of PARP inhibitors for women who are carrying BRCA or BRCA1 or 2 mutations but the improvements in survival have been pretty modest, even in the addition of this, BRAC, of this PARP inhibitor. We have a long way to go to try and improve survivorship for ovarian cancer. The five-year survival rate is only 26%. Um, this late diagnosis is driven by a few different factors. Some of it is a very incomplete understanding of the genetic risk factors, so that's very difficult to screen people early. And there are no reliable early biomarkers, which is part of why I'm working with Sarah. We're trying to find some protein biomarkers. The next slide, please. So the goal of the study was based around a hypothesis that I had formed in collaboration with Simon Gaither, who I work with over at BFG, and we were trying to think about the concepts of genomic changes driving chemo resistance in the tumours as they're being exposed to chemotherapy, a little bit along the lines of the way antibiotic resistance might form in a population of bacterial cells that are exposed to antibiotics. Um, and we identified a cohort of patients from the Women's Cancer Program Biorepository, which is a spectacular resource available. Um, patients have been giving samples of their tumours and blood and serum and DNA for a couple of decades into that repository. And we have one of the few um, cohorts in the world with matched chemo-naive, untreated primary tumours and recurrent chemo-resistant tumours from the same woman. Very few people have these samples available to them. We were lucky enough to collaborate with Beth Carlin and to develop the project. So we identified 11 women with inherited germline mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2, and 17 women who have no really known or identified risk factor in their genes for ovarian cancer, but they had developed it nonetheless. We took these paired primary and recurrent tumours from these patients and they were fresh frozen samples of beautiful quality available for us. And we've done a whole bunch of omics, but given that I have 15 minutes today, I'm going to really focus in on the methylation profiling because that's quite hot and novel in terms of the methodologies and the gene expression profiling because we think that those two really go hand in hand. We think about methylation being the addition of a modification to the DNA that acts as a molecular switch to turn on and off gene activity. So we want to compare those together. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the clinical profile of the cohort. On the left-hand side here, this is a time to event plot where each column represents a different patient. Um, and the circles are showing you the recurrence events. So unfortunately, ovarian cancer is a type of diagnosis where you will go through chemotherapy and probably respond quite well, but the disease is almost certainly going to return. Uh, you will receive more chemotherapy. Perhaps it will be marked as being sensitive and the tumor will shrink in size. Eventually, 80% of these patients are going to develop chemo resistance and they're going to have multiple recurrent events. As you can see, most people's line ends in a black square, which unfortunately is death. The majority of patients in our cohort have succumbed to disease. Uh, and you can see on the left, but it's a little more easy to kind of define if you look at the survival curve on the right, that those women who have inherited a germline mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, although they have a much higher risk to develop ovarian cancer, they actually survive a little longer and they respond to their medication, to the chemotherapy a little better. And this has been previously reported and we were happy to see that our cohort was quite representative of other cohorts. And we saw that same pattern across the individuals that we included in the study. Next slide, please. So this is a heat map of genome-wide methylation. And I know that it's absolutely a lot, so I'm gonna go through it. Each row here represents a different tumor that has come from a patient. And I've split it through the middle and grouped the patients and the tumours based on whether they were primary chemo-naive tumours or recurrent chemo-resistant tumours on the bottom. And the colour code on the left shows you the BRCA carrier status of the woman that we collected the tumour from at surgery. 
And the columns here all represent chromosomes. So we're looking at an entire genome-wide map of single nucleotide resolution methylation, which is a bit of a marvel of modern molecular biology. It's a relatively new method, but it gives us the most amazing resolution to really identify what's happening with these molecular switches and gene regulation. So when we make a plot like this, what we really hope will happen ideally is that there'll be very clear patterns and clusters that will jump out and you'll say, wow, look at those 10 tumours. They all look so similar. What are the differences that define them? And when we opened this, we looked at it and thought, wow, what's very striking is that there are no clusters and no real significant patterns of shared, pa of shared methylation signatures. And it defines something that's very important clinically, but also at the molecular level in ovarian cancer. That is incredible heterogeneity. We do not see shared changes in methylation across the cohort. We do see some subclusters that are potentially forming at this point, but we need to dig deeper to find out what they are. And so that's what we did. Next slide, please. An important um, sort of mechanism of methylation regulation in cancer occurs in these regions that are called partially methylated domains or PMDs. And they're these long stretches in the genome that generally don't have many genes inside of them. And if they do have genes within these domains, they tend to be low level expressed, but very variably expressed. So they'll be off in many samples, but very, very high in one or two. It's a new phenomenon. We don't understand it very deeply. We suspect it's linked to the mitotic clock or the rapid rate of cell division that we see in cancer. It's about proliferation. So we're able now with this resolution of methylation data that we've generated to go through the entire genome and to be able to make maps of partially methylated domains as they exist in each individual tumour. And so that's essentially what we did. Next slide, please. We know that it's been reported in other cancers that these partially methylated domains can drive much of the heterogeneity observed between individual tumours and given that we saw so much heterogeneity, we knew it was important to focus on this. And so that's what we did to begin with. We went through and calculated how much of each genome was covered by a partially methylated domains, and it ranged enormously. There are some patients in our cohort where almost their entire genome is completely methylated, which means that molecular switch is set to off and the gene transcription program is highly restricted. And then there are other tumours in the cohort where PMDs cover, you know, two thirds of the genome, up to 60%. But what was very remarkable is when we compared these patterns between individual tumours, we found that less, potent, less than 10% of the genome in any one tumour is covered by common partially methylated domains that are occurring in half or more of the cohort. And it is underscoring incredible heterogeneity in these tumours. When we think about how to remove some of this heterogeneity, knowing that these are gene poor regions and that the molecular switches are set to off, we're able to mask those regions of the genome out on an individual tumor by tumor basis so that we're retaining regions of the genome that don't have this noise carried forward. And panels B and C in these plots here are showing you that when we do principal components analysis here where each circle represents a different tumor, we use information from all across the genome to look for shared similarity. We see this dark blue to bright yellow axis going from left to right in panel B. And when we mask these regions of the genome out, you can see that that pattern or structure is lost. And that was very important. That replicated using a second analysis method that focused on a very specific sequence context type of molecular switch called a solo WCGW. And we see this loss of a strong correlation in panel C. So we did this masking, we checked afterwards and found that the heterogeneity was dampened down certainly, and then we're ready to proceed to look for hopefully clearly structured populations in the cohort. Next slide, please. And so we do that by choosing the most variable methylation sites across the genome. And this plot here, each row is a different methylation residue or CPG residue, and we're showing you 10,000 rows. Each column is a different tumor from a different patient. And the original version of this plot would have gone all the way off the top of the screen to the ceiling almost because we have such a rich annotation database of clinical information about the patients. We were looking for patterns and structure in our plot to form that might be guided by primary versus recurrent status, chemosensitivity status, 
perhaps BRCA mutation status, homologous recombination deficiency scores, treatment regime or chemotherapy exposures, patient demographics. We made it through more than 50 of these categories and we did not find anything that informed the clustering until we did something really simple and we added the patient ID as a colour and that's shown here with the green arrow. And you can see here almost all of the time the individual tumours from a single patient are right next to each other in this map which is telling us that there are very few differences between the primary and the recurrent chemo-resistant tumour from a single patient. And this was absolutely shocking to us. We really thought there was going to be reprogramming occurring as a result of chemotherapy uh, exposure, because that's what had been reported in the literature using much less sophisticated analytic methods. Next slide, please. So we needed to go back and do a little bit of um, confirmation that the genes that we were going to be interested in looking at this molecular, these molecular switches controlling were genuinely you know, low level expressed in the masked regions, which they were. We actually also were able to show that tumor suppressor genes were preferentially excluded from these quietened regions of the genome and that the tumor suppressor genes, particularly susceptible in ovarian cancer, were very strongly enriched outside of these regions. And that's quite an important result. We wanted to be able to reaffirm this finding of the patient's primary and recurrent tumours being very highly related to one another using our second data set, which is that very deep RNA-seq. So we generated more than 300 million reads per tumour, which is enormous, but it allowed us to have a lot of precision in making this measurement. And the two plots in panel A, the left and the right, all you need to be able to see from that is that they are the same. We had the same pattern in the RNA-seq data as well. So we see very little shift in gene expression as the um, disease progresses from a chemo-naive stage 3 or stage 4 tumour into a progressive resistant tumour um, that has seen huge amounts of chemotherapy. And that was a really significant shock. That was a big surprise to me, that's for sure. Next slide, please. So we wanted to try and find regions of the genome that were differentially methylated. The primary goal of the project was to find these between primary and recurrent tumours, and we really couldn't do it. We tried to do the analysis every way we thought was robust and rigorous. We could not consistently find conserved changes in methylation that were shared across multiple patients. Um, part of that is the heterogeneity of the disease, um, but also part of that is just there are not many there to find. But what we did do is group the patients or group the tumours based on the inherited BRCA mutation status um, of, the, of the individuals that contributed these samples to the biobank. And when we compare tumours from BRCA, inherited BRCA mutations and patients who did not inherit a BRCA mutation, when we compare the methylation in across their tumours, we find 135 differentially methylated regions. Uh, and this was um, quite a novel result and it was really exciting to us. We saw a gradient or a trend towards the principal components plot to be able to separate some of these individuals. And on the right hand side, I've given a graphical representation where each row is the methylation level of a different tumour across a selected region of the genome where we found one of these. You can see that in the orange samples on the top, which are the BRCA carriers, the BRCA mutation carriers, those tumours are highly, highly methylated at this specific region I've highlighted with the box, whereas the non-mutant, non-BRCA mutation carrier tumours are completely demethylated at that position. And that position actually overlaps an enhancer that's in an untranslated region of a gene that's completely silent. So it's going off and having some distal molecular switch or gene regulatory activity. And that's something that we are uh, following up a little bit to try and figure out exactly what it is that uh, that, that region is controlling. Uh, next slide, please. So given that we found these significant differences, not between primary and recurrent, but between BRCA carrier and BRCA non-carrier tumours, we wanted to see if we could support this result with our RNA-seq data and our gene expression profiling. And I'm happy to say we really were able to do it. So we were able to replicate the same trend of BRCA status, being able to separate the tumours into these two groups. And when we did the differential gene expression analysis, we found a couple of thousand genes that were differentially expressed um, between these two groups of tumours. 
we wanted to map these individual genes onto pathways to try and get some understanding of the biology as to what what is what are the pathways and what's the biology that's driving these differences. And when we did, it was incredibly striking. So on the right-hand side, you can see those gold bars shooting out to the right-hand side, and that is representing genes that are highly expressed in the tumours that come from women who have inherited BRCA mutations. And these pathways are almost entirely immune-related pathways. They are autoimmune disease, they are immune activation, antigen presentation pathways. So it looks as though there is immune activation in the BRCA mutation carrying tumours that is absolutely absent from those BRCA, we call them wild type, but that's a misnomer, the BRCA non-carrier tumours. The blue bars that are pointing out to the left, they're telling us about the pathways that are overexpressed in those non BRCA mutated tumors. And they are really consistently cancer related pathways, proliferation and growth related pathways, and very interestingly, pathways that are important for maintaining a stem like phenotype. So we were really able to replicate that. The biggest difference we see across the cohort is based on BRCA status and not by anything else. Uh, next slide, please. So although I've only had 15 minutes, hopefully I've walked you through the analysis and through the project a little bit. We have actually three other types of omics that are being generated and some of them are in the analysis stage, some of them we're still generating data, but the project continues to evolve. The basic findings that we have from this part of the analysis are really that we've been able to show robustly with these two data types that the chemo resistance that we thought was conferred as a result of exposure to chemotherapy is probably there very early in tumor development. We see very few changes in these tumors after exposure, even to years of chemotherapy. And that was very surprising. My hypothesis was very wrong. But now we have this new sort of very insightful data. We have so many new hypotheses that we have to pursue. We see very extensive differences in gene expression and methylation between the tumors based on their BRCA, BRCA carrier status. Um, and those changes have not been previously reported. I was very surprised, but no one has done this comparison before to try and define some of the differences in uh, why those patients are surviving longer. And we suspect it could be due to immune activation in the BRCA carrier tumors. We saw enormous levels of heterogeneity across the cohort, and that really underpins what the clinicians often report, which is a lot of heterogeneity between patients in terms of their response. Uh, and that is not very well understood. And I can certainly understand why now that we've started digging through some of these genomes. And then the last point I'd just like to make is there have been clinical trials going for demethylating agents, specifically in chemo-resistant um, recurrent high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And I think in the hope that it would be effective, uh, you know, more effective than it had been initially in primary. And I think the data I've shown today really would suggest that targeting the methylome in these tumours is unlikely to have any success. These are highly toxic drugs and have a lot of side effects. And I would sort of suggest that maybe we need to have a conversation uh, in the clinical space about whether or not those trials should be ongoing and whether we should have realistic expectations of what those outcomes should be. Uh, and then last slide, please, for the acknowledgements. So I'd just like to say thank you to the enormous team of people who have contributed to the project. Um, we've been working on it for three years so far, and I really appreciate everyone's uh, insight and expertise. It's helped uh, move the project along. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Jones. That was really great. Um, I really appreciate the, the talk. and. Um, uh, Dr. Taylor has a comment which says, I saw what looked like TH1 and TH2 signals in the gold versus blue, which he says, fantastic. I don't know if you want to respond to that or, or, or confirm that. Yes, yeah, it, and it does, and it does really look that way. I am a genetic epidemiologist by training, to be honest. So immunology has not been something that I've spent huge amounts of time working on. But any cancer and immunology related people, when they look at these data with us, they think that is really exciting development because ovarian tumors have been known to be uh, immune cold. It's kind of the name that gets they get labeled with, uh, and that really kind of dims the hopes for drug development in the future. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work to be done in the drug development space for ovarian. It's been very difficult to find targeted therapies. So we're aiming to continue profiling samples.
Um, and I would hope that if, as we add to the cohort, we can try and strengthen that signal and then really narrow down, try and bore down a little with a little more resolution on what's really happening with immune activation. Great, thank you so much. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ishimori to introduce our next speaker. I realize I need to unmute myself. So our next speaker is Mia Pollock, who is an uh, inpatient clinical pharmacist at Cedar sinai Medical Center. She completed her doctorate in pharmacy at the University of California in San Francisco and finished her residency here at Cedar sinai She will be speaking us today with her talk entitled Gender Pharmacological Disparities, Does One Drug Fit All? Hi, everyone. Just give me one second to um, get the presentation. Hold on one moment. Sure. Well, that's happening. I was just going to jump in. I had a comment from the last talk and just my impression overall. We're hearing and seeing a lot of immune related differences that um, affect women more than men and are answering and addressing some of these questions today. I, it's really striking to me. Of course, I do MS, which is an autoimmune disease that affects women more than men. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Ishimori can speak to autoimmunity being obviously affecting women more than men. But I think it's a really interesting to hear it across all the different presentations um, and it might be something to be thinking about in a bigger way um, as we, because if we are thinking about neurodegenerative diseases, which affect women at the same ratios um, as MS compared to men, and immune function seems to be important in neurodegenerative diseases. So just some food for thought. Thanks to everyone for your great presentations. Okay, um, if, if everyone's ready, let me just go and try to share my screen really quickly. Can everyone see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. While you're while you're doing that, I'm going to comment on what Nancy said. We saw Th1, Th2 differences in the type of vascular bottling that occurred in cardiovascular disease, and whether it looked more like males or females. Perfect. We can see it now. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction. Um, my name is Mia Pollock, and I am one of the inpatient clinical pharmacists here at Cedars. And today I will be sharing with you a collaborative presentation with two of my colleagues, Dr. Fong Ho and Dr. Vina Rushi, on the evaluation of gender pharmacological differences and posing the question, does one drug fit all? And why should we care? Well, our number one priority is to provide the best care for our patients. And how can we do that without understanding how each of us are engineered, which may impact the medications we take or how these medications may affect us. But before we get started, I wanted to go over the difference between sex and gender. And sex refers to the biological difference between males and females, where gender is more difficult to define, but it can refer to the role of a male or female in society known as a gender role or gender identity. And for the purpose of this presentation, I will be using the term gender and sex interchangeably. For our agenda today, I'll provide some background on the topic that will include evaluating representation, gender representation in clinical trials. We'll look at gender differences within both pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And don't worry if you're not too familiar with what these terms mean, I will dive deeper into them throughout the course of this presentation. And then I'll apply these principles using a couple medication examples specifically within cardiovascular disease. And for the purposes of time, I'll only focus on this disease state. But just to note that these gender differences are widely seen across various disease states and medications. Now, eight of the 10 drugs removed from the US market between 1997 and 2000 pose greater health risks for women than for men. And the FDA has suggested that women experience more adverse events than men, and those adverse events are more serious in women. Sex-specific differences in PK and PD have been reported to yield important clinical consequences, which may lead to these adverse drug events. And this was illustrated in a study where they found that elevated drug concentrations and longer drug elimination times were manifested by women, 
which were strongly linked to sex differences in adverse drug reactions. Now, we need to shed light on this topic because women present one and a half to 1.7 fold incidence of adverse drug reactions that tend, tended to be more severe in men, requiring more frequent hospital admissions. Now, physicians may lack some gender specific prescribing expertise. There was a qualitative study performed in Sweden where the objective was to gauge a group of general practitioners' perception of sex and gender aspects in medical treatment. Now, these general practitioners, mainly physicians working in primary care settings, they stated they had little knowledge of sex and gender differences in drug treatment. So this really illustrates the importance of education on sex and gender in drug treatment to help guide healthcare practitioners. And it is possible that these adverse drug reactions may be linked to the underrepresentation of women in clinical trials. And more to this on the next slide. Now, the inclusion of women in clinical trials and analyses of potential gender differences in treatment response have been really integral to the drug approval process. And the FDA has continuously pushed for appropriate demographic inclusion in the clinical evaluation of drugs. And since the 1990s, female representation has increased from 20% to 45% in 2012. But although female representation has improved, interestingly, women's participation has historically been the lowest in cardiovascular trials. And this underrepresentation, it does have an important implication is that it contributes to the limited recognition of these sex-based differences in responses to cardiovascular drugs, thereby it prevents the optimization of therapy for women across all ages. Looking at PK and PD, and what's really the difference between these two terms, and in a nutshell, pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug, involving the rate and extent of drug movement through the body, which can be broken down into four phases. So we have absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion. And pharmacodynamics is just vice versa. It is what's, what the drug does to the body. And at this junction, we're just going to focus primarily on pharmacokinetics first. So the first phase of PK is absorption, which is really just the transport of unmetabolized drug from the site of administration, whether it's orally or transdermally through the skin to the body's circulation system. The pH of your gut is one factor for drug absorption, and it's been shown that women produce less stomach acid and can result in the decreased absorption of some medications. And additionally, drug absorption occurs at different sites along the GI tract. And it was found that generally drugs move slower through our guts compared to men. Our second phase, which is distribution, is the process of delivering a drug from our bloodstream to the tissues of the body. And I wanted to preface first that these comparisons to men are in general. And the distribution of a drug is affected by multiple body composi composition parameters. Women have increased body fat compared to men, which can increase the overall distribution of fat-soluble medications and could possibly lead to longer drug effects, and tailoring for body and size weight is also an important consideration when dosing patients. Now, on average, women have less blood volume compared to men, therefore women may experience a faster onset of action. Women generally have decreased size organs and decreased blood flow, and protein binding may affect drug activity in one of two ways, either changing the effective concentration of the, of the drug at its site of action or by changing the rate at which the drug is eliminated. So sex-related differences um, within this area are generally where, though some report less protein binding in women, but there has been no necessarily direct link discovered yet to sex-specific adverse drug reactions. Lastly, we have metabolism and excretion. Drug metabolism is the chemical alteration of a drug by the body, and some drug metabolizing liver enzymes show sex-related differences, which may increase drug metabolism in women, therefore may increase the rate of elimination 
of drugs by these particular liver enzymes. And the kidneys, as we know, are the major organ of drug excretion, and kidney clearance is generally lower in women than in men. Therefore, women may have less drug excretion. Now, a few specific sex considerations for females include sex hormones, oral contraceptives, menopause, and pregnancy, and increased levels of estrogen and progesterone may change drug meta metabolizing activity, which can increase drug accumulation or decrease the elimination of some drugs. Now, with respect to oral contraceptives and menopause, overall, there are conflicting results whether oral contraceptives or menopause have an effect on the PK and PD of medications, but some studies have shown that oral contraceptives may lead to an, an increased exposure of certain medications. Several physiological changes that occur during gestation are known to affect drug plasma levels as well, and these include changes in drug distribution, cardiovascular, and renal. Now, for drug distribution, an increase in total body water and fat in pregnant women can lead to an increased drug distribution to the tissues, whereas cardiovascular pregnant women have an increased cardiac output. And as the circulation expands, allowing increased blood flow to the uterus and to the organs to meet the increased metabolic needs of the tissues, this leads to a lowering of blood pressure. And this increased vo blood volume and cardiac output during pregnancy causes a subsequent increase in kidney blood flow. So we've discussed the various phases within pharmacokinetics. Now let's take a closer look at pharmacodynamics, which is what the drug does to the body. Looking more into our overall clinical response to medications. And as a reminder, we'll only focus on cardiovascular pharmacodynamics. So cardiovascular disease develops seven to 10 years later in women than in men, and is still a major cause of death in women over the age of 65. And the prevalence of heart attacks has also increased in middle-aged women while decrease in similarly aged men. And women are more likely to be excluded from clinical trials given the increase in prevalence of these cardiovascular risk factors. Now, given these facts, let's try to understand why looking at gender differences within cardiovascular physiology. Broken down into three components, we have anatomy, which women generally have decreased heart sizes. And most women have smaller blood vessels, which puts them at increased risk for coronary occlusion. Looking at physiology, women tend to have an increased resting heart rate, and C-reactive protein may be elevated in the presence of increased estrogen levels, which has been associated with plaque development. And looking at comorbid diseases with respect to diabetes and high cholesterol, women tend to have a higher risk of developing. We wanted to highlight just a few cardiovascular medication examples that demonstrates sex-related differences in clinical response of these medications. And we broke it down into two medication classes. First are the anticoagulants. These are our blood thinners. And we're going to compare warfarin, our longtime and well-known oral anticoagulant, to our newer oral anticoagulants, or NOACs, which you may be becoming more familiar with, and are increasingly gaining popularity, which are apixaban, or known as Eliquis, and rivaroxaban, or known as Xarelto. And our second medication class are going to be our beta blockers, used commonly as are antihypertensive agents or for controlling heart rate. Now, women uh, with acute coronary syndrome have an increased risk of major bleeding than men, and that could be potentially likely due to their smaller body size, reduced kidney function, or a higher prevalence of comorbidities, as I've just alluded to. And comparing warfarin and the NOACs, warfarin decreased the risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation in men and women, and do not pose a greater risk of major bleeding in women. However, women did have an increase in minor bleeding complications compared to men and required lower doses to keep patients within a therapeutic window. In contrast, NOACs also decreased the event rate in both sexes, but women actually suffered 
significantly less bleeding rates than NOAX compared to warfarin, while men had similar bleeding rates. Therefore, you know, this demonstrates a more beneficial side effect in profile in women based on what was observed in its clinical trials. Now, looking at beta blockers, from a pharmacokinetic standpoint, women had increased concentrations of mertoprolol, which is one of the drugs within its class, when administered the same dose in both sexes. And the study hypothesized that this may have been attributed to the enhanced absorption or differences in the drug the drug's metabolizing enzyme activity. Now, if we have increased drug concentrations in women, then we can anticipate that women will subsequently experience a greater decrease in heart rate and blood pressure, and which they did. But despite greater clinical effects observed in women, they, there were conflicting results in various cardiovascular trials on beta blocker mortality benefit, and this may have been attributed to the underrepresentation of women. And looking at the female de demographics, women were older and had more comorbid conditions than the male cohorts. Now we can really come back to answer our first question. And does one drug really fit all? Well, the answer is not really. And as we've seen, that gender-specific differences exist within pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And what is important is that we understand these differences so that we may use this information and attribute them to the different effect profiles of various drugs. Now, there are still large gaps in our knowledge of sex differences in clinical pharmacology, and more research is needed within this area. But this is a huge education opportunity that we need to shed more light on so that we can bridge knowledge gaps on gender-specific prescribing. And we will continue to do so to optimize the efficacy and safety of medications, continuing toward our main purpose, which is really for providing the best care for our patients. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Rita Shane, uh, Dr. Lydia No, and Dr. Sarah Kilpatrick for our guidance on this presentation and allowing me to present on this topic. And these are my references, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for an interesting talk. Um, I think what's interesting is that when we do clinical trials, we don't usually break down side effects by sex or gender. So, you know, in rheumatology, we're doing a lot of testing on biological agents. Obviously, some diseases like lupus are predominantly female, so we really can't do a real gender breakdown when we have 10 men in the entire study. Um, but certainly for a lot of our other diseases, um, you know, we really don't think about the pharmacokinetics. And one of the interesting things, um, you know, for example, in women, we see a little bit more phospholipid antibody syndrome, which is an immune coagulation uh, syndrome more in women than men. And it's interesting because the NOx, you know, would be like a lower risk for bleeding. But we do also know that NOx actually don't prevent, have not conclusively prevented um, subsequent clotting events in women and with that specific disease. So we end up having to use warfarin or lovinox in those women. So mm -hmm. I think it's a very interesting kind of layered scenario where it's great that there are these anticoagulants, but then in these female predominant immune-based diseases, they actually don't work, you know? And so obviously we, yeah. we need a lot more information in this area. We never think about this. Definitely. It's something I think that I think more clinical articles or journal articles need to pay closer attention and analysis of these separate two groups because there are various you know, variances between us with respect to body weight, size, and these are general terms, but it is interesting to look at. I think when we break it down into you know, males, females, um, that there is, there is potentially something there. Great. Thank you, Mia. That was a really interesting and, and pertinent talk and, and you did a great job. So thank you. So I'm going to turn us over to Dr. Sycott to introduce our last speaker. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, Sarah, uh, and everyone for organizing. This has gone really well. So um, our next and I guess last speaker before our final questions is Suzanne Devkota. She's an assistant professor in the Karsh Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Cedar sinai and she's investigating the role of the gut microbiome and in inflammatory bowel diseases. She received a master's in nutritional sciences from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and her PhD from the University of Chicago in molecular metabolism and nutrition. And that's where she began specializing in gastroenterology and the newly emerging field of the microbiome. 
She went on to complete her postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School to study the microbiome in metabolic diseases, and her work seeks to uncover mechanisms by which perturbations in the gut microbiota serve as early indicators of systemic disease. And her talk today is about, um, is a question, do sex differences affect the gut microbiome? So I'm very much looking forward to it and welcome Dr. Dev Koda. Thank you very much. Um, and let me share my screen. Okay, I presume you can all see this. Great, thank you. Um, I think, well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me uh, to speak to you all today. The talks so far have been absolutely fabulous. And I uh, don't often, you know, if I'm honest, I don't often think of this aspect um, of sex differences in the gut microbiome. And honestly, most of our field doesn't, the microbiome field doesn't, um, which you will, you will discover today in my presentation. Um, but I think Nancy brought up the really important question that there's this theme of immune differences um, that, that everyone sort of spoke to. And I'm going to further speak to that and add an additional component, which is the, the microbiome effects um, and how that relates to immunity and potentially sexual dimorphism. And I think there's, you know, I, I think there could be some really cool collaborative opportunities. So I would welcome that um, if. Uh, any ideas strike you um, after my talk. So I'll give you just a little bit of a brief primer on the microbiome because it might be new to, to some of you. Um, but I always, you know, I like to start off with this point um, that your body really is mostly microbes. And so if we put some, you know, numbers to that, one kilogram of your body weight is, is bacteria. Um, and that comes out to about 100 trillion um, bacteria, give or take a few. Um, and so essentially you're outnumbered 10 to one on a cellular basis. Um, now that number has sort of been revised uh, in the last few years, um, but on the low end it's one to one. So for every human cell you have, you have a bacterial cell. And that's still a huge, huge number, proportion of your body that's bacteria. So there has to be, there absolutely has to be a physiological um, impact. Um, and that's really how the whole field started is understanding that your body is mostly microbes. They're not all pathogens. Actually, they're mostly not pathogens. Um, and they're interacting with our body. They do things for us um, and they help us, but they also can cause problems um, in response to decisions that we make about our health and our lifestyle. So humans have about 22,000 unique genes, but the collective microbiome in your body has 8 million unique genes. Microbes are pretty uh, efficient um, in, in their genome. And so there's more, certainly more microbial genes in our body than human genes. And that's pretty remarkable. So in terms of where do where are the microbial niches in our body, um, these in this figure, these are the defined niches. And the niche is de defined as these are the sites that harbor bacteria from essentially birth onwards. So these are co-evolved. They live in these body sites um, and these are not causing an overt immune response. So you will notice a common theme here is they like mucosal surfaces. They live in your nose, in your mouth, um, when they're on the skin, they tend to aggregate in the moist parts. So, you know, the crook of your elbow, behind your ear, um, behind your knees, you know, areas like that, moist spots. Um, certainly the GI tract, which is, has the highest density of microbes in your body, and the urogenital tract. However, uh, in recent years, people are finding bacteria in atypical sites. And, you know, many of us have put forward that actually the body is it's harder to prove that there's sterility in the body than there is, you know, than there is uh, bacteria in atypical sites. And so some examples are, um, you know, the bladder is typically described as should be sterile, right? For obvious reasons that we all know. But um, even from Cedars researchers have found that there, there actually are bacteria normally living in, in the bladder. So what are the implications of, of that? Um, the placental microbiome is probably the most controversial field in, in microbiome research right now. Um, and the, the, 
uh, part of the reason is there is a couple very controversial papers that came out many years ago saying that the placenta is actually colonized. So I show you this figure of niches, and they propose that the placenta is one of these niches. And then the whole field just erupted saying that's absolutely impossible. That goes against everything we know about immunity and, and how the fetus develops. And it makes no sense that you have bacteria in the placenta. And what it actually turned out was in those earlier studies, there was a lot of reagent contamination. Um, and so many of those bugs that they discovered were actually environmental microbes. But some studies have come out showing different aspects of that where um, it may not be that the placenta is microbially colonized, but it is possible because microbes we do know can travel through their bloodstream or bacterial products can travel through their bloodstream, that there's transient traveling of microbes around in and around the placenta. So that may be a possibility, but the concept of colonization uh, in utero colonization is, is very unlikely. Um, and then work from our group and, and others have shown that bacteria can actually colonize adipose tissue um, coming from the gut. So bacteria do translocate, they do leave these niche sites and go other places. So the questions always are, what is real? You know, what, are, what is a real niche versus transient? Uh, and what's contamination? Because we always, you know, bugs are in the environment everywhere on your keyboard, um, on your phone, they're, they're everywhere. So um, there, again, until recently, I recently meaning like six, seven years ago, um, there's been really little research into sex differences in the microbiome. And, um, but little bits of data would start to emerge and it was usually after the fact. So someone would do a study on, you know, the immune system or metabolism. And then when, when they started analyzing the data, they would say, oh my gosh, there seems to be this difference between males and females. And then what people would do is decide, hey, I'm only going to use males or females to eliminate that, that uh, confounding aspect without actually embracing it and saying, hey, maybe there's something there. But there has been some data that's sort of compelling. And I think the field is starting to move toward appreciating that these sex differences occur and, and are impactful. So there are known um, sex differences in response to viral infections. Females tend to have um, a more severe response to viruses than males do, and it is largely related to their immune response, um, which I think ties in a lot to some of the, the, the presentations from earlier today. Now, so if, if that's established that, that females have a worse uh, response to, to viruses because of the immune system, and then we know that the um, immune system can affect the gut bacteria and vice versa, um, and really primarily the gut, but this is also true in the skin and in the oral cavity and so on. So if you know that, that the, the, the uh, uh, immune response to viruses is, is may have a sexual dimorphism and that bacteria and immune response are interacting, then it's likely that there's also sexual dimorphism in, in the microbiome related to the immune response. So the first big, like impactful study in the high impact paper that came out on this topic uh, was about uh, six years ago, seven years ago. And they coined the term the microgenderome. And I take issue with this, this uh, term um, because as I think Doris mentioned in the very beginning, you know, gender is <clears throat> more of a social construct, but what they're really talking about here is sex differences. But it flows better, I think, when you say it to say microgenderome. So. Uh, that, that is what, what it is. Um, but what they found um, in this paper was that uh, there are sex differences in autoimmunity and it is driven by the gut microbiome um, uh, in, a, in a hormone dependent way. And in this context, they use type 1 diabetes as, as their model. And this was, this was a rodent study. So they used in this study um, uh, the uh, non-obese diabetic mouse, the NOD mouse. And in this mouse model, um, uh, females get worse disease than, than males. And you get spontaneous uh, destruction of insulin-producing beta cells. Uh, in human type 1 diabetes, um, it sort usually it happens before puberty, and it tends to affect males and females sort of uh, the same. So this model um, doesn't totally recapitulate the human situation in terms of the sex differences. However, the study was so striking um, 
that you can almost ignore that and you'll see why in this data. So in this first, um, in this first figure, it's just showing the normal type one diabetes incidence in, in this mouse model. So females have higher incidence than males do, and this is very, this is a standard incidence. Um, here, so this is a normal mouse. Here, this is in germ-free mice. So germ-free mice are mice raised from birth without any my, completely absent microbiome. So the, the parents don't have a microbiome, the, the pups don't have a microbiome, and they're raised in these sterile bubbles through, throughout their whole life. They never have a microbiome. And they actually, they have some weird physiological things that I won't go into right now, but for all intents and purposes, they breed normally and function normally. But in the, in the NOD germ-free model, that sexual dimorphism between incidence of, of, um, uh, of uh, disease is completely gone when you remove the microbiome. And that's pretty amazing. Um, in this figure, they then measure testosterone. Um, and here, SPF means specific, specific pathogen-free. That's essentially a normal, normal mouse with a normal microbiota. And if you look at the females and the males, obviously there's a, the males have more testosterone than the females. But when you compare the germ-free females to the germ-free males, that difference isn't nearly as pronounced. This is a principal coordinate analysis, um, basically showing clustering of microbiome differences between different groups. Um, and you're really just looking for grouping, you know, if there's any grouping of the dots. And here, these are the normal conventional mouse. And when you have normal microbiota, you can see that the males separate distinctly from the females. But when you have removed the microbiota and you're a germ-free mouse, that distinction is completely gone. Now, these experiments were very interesting from the same paper. So uh, you may have heard about fecal transplants. It happens in humans, and it's very effective for certain conditions. But it's a very useful tool in mouse studies. Um, when you're trying to see if you can transfer a phenotype via the gut microbiome. So what they did here was they took the NOD mouse, germ-free um, female NOD mouse, and this is just the black lines, the normal trajectory of diabetes incidence, and then they gave just female to female stool. So they took female NOD mouse stool and gave it to the germ-free female, and the type 1 diabetes incidence was exactly the same. So female to female, no difference. But here, this is a female NOD mouse gavaged, uh, colonized with a male microbiota, and you can see her diabetes incidence was dramatically reduced, almost to the level of the male microbiota, suggesting that you can transfer that phenotype between males and females. Now, this study was actually quite interesting. What they did was, again, this is um, uh, uh, these are NOD skid mice, so immune deficient mice. And they took, they, did a, they took splenic T cells from these mice over here and transferred them to female NOD skid mice, okay? The first group, um, the uh, black group is just unmanipulated skid mice females and their type one diabetes incidence was quite similar to the uh, non-skid female NOD mouse. Here, um, they did the uh, T cells from the males into the females, and you can see the type one diabetes incidence was decreased uh, dramatically, showing that this is likely T cell mediated. And then here, the orange group is quite interesting. They gave the male, um, the male uh, microbiota to the female mice, but they treated them with an androgen antagonist. So essentially the effect of testosterone was gone and the incidence of diabetes was almost identical to the, the females. So it's both hormonal and it's T cell mediated. So the conclusions from this study um, were that these were in young mice that by manipulating the microbiome, essentially removal, testing, you know, presence or absence and transfer from males to females, um, uh, demonstrated that uh, testosterone and metabolite changes were sufficient um, to oppose this genetically programmed autoimmunity for type 1 diabetes. But what they also found I didn't show was that fertility wasn't compromised in these mice. So the study was a really, I mean, it was really the first study to, as its intent was to explore the, the sexual dimorphism um, and autoimmunity via the microbiome versus after the fact. 
Um, and but interestingly, um, there have been studies. But again, I, I want to highlight that um, probably every one of these studies um, in rodents and humans really um, looked at the, the sex differences as an afterthought. Um, and these are pretty much the most, I guess, um, uh, I interesting studies to date. But um, I didn't just pick six. These actually all is all there is. Um, there, there just is not much out there um, really looking at this. And, and I would argue that we really need to, to look at this. Um, and a lot of this work still is in mice. Um, and we need to do more human studies. Um, and I think this group here is, is really well positioned to, um, to kind of approach this in, in humans. So what is what is the future hold beyond just my positive outlook for all the opportunities that there are to, to research in this area? Um, with the emergence of there's new axes. So what do I mean by that? The gut microbiome is sort of like ground zero. That's where everyone in the microbiome field is really focused. Um, but there are gut lung axes. There's now a gut brain axis, which I want to talk about for a moment. And um, in particular, this is a really, really hotly studied area in, in autism, um, in um, major depressive disorder and anxiety. And we know that there, there is sex differences in, um, in psych psychiatric and, and neurodevelopment um, uh, conditions. And now with the introduction of a gut brain axis, and some of the previous literature saw, showing that um, the gut microbiome can affect, you know, or, or be affected by hormonal um, differences. Does that then mean that the microbiome might actually be a, a possible avenue for understanding um, these gender differences in, in uh, neurological and psychiatric conditions between males and females? So there actually is a new term, there's always a new term coined every day. Um, the psychobiome, I think was actually just coined this year. Um, and uh, because there's a, a, a really strong group of, of researchers and studying this gut brain axis, and I think there's a really interesting um, uh, avenue here. And actually, there's um, a study right now that um, uh, I'm doing with Clive Svensson and Barry McGovern, where with their chip model, we can actually take them in the context of Parkinson's disease for this project is they're actually connecting um, the gut chip with the blood brain barrier on one side and a neuron chip on the other side. So we can actually connect gut and brain in a model um, using human um, iPSCs. And what we're doing there is uh, flowing uh, both harmful and beneficial bacteria on the gut side to see if we can actually influence brain function on the other side of the chip. So those are just what possible models for studying this, but I think there's many other ways to translate that research into, into humans directly. And uh, just to highlight up here, some of the areas, at least from the microbiome field, possible microbiome therapeutics that, that the field is really into right now. You hear a lot about probiotics. I'm not so hot on probiotics personally. Um, in general, these are not recommended really anymore. And there's a body of literature showing that probiotics are not nearly as effective as we thought. But prebiotics are interesting. And these are dietary components that can influence the gut microbiome that you already have in your gut. And, and selectively promote the beneficial ones. Um, and symbiotics are the introduction of prebiotics with probiotic bacteria, sort of giving them a stronger, sort of better chance of survival. And uh, bacterial therapies are engineered microbes that can have sort of selective effects on, on the gut directly. So those all fall under live biotherapeutics. And with that, um, I will take any questions. Great. Well, that was really, really interesting. I think there is um, a question from Susan Chang. Or wait, let's see. Uh, there's one um, one question. Don't bacteria make testosterone? So bacteria can make hormones, yes. Um, what, uh, do they make testosterone specifically? I think that's true. Um, what if the chemical structure is exactly the same as human testosterone? I don't know. I don't actually, I'm not studying the, the 
the hormonal production of microbes. Microbes produce all sorts of hor hormones. They produce serotonin. They produce a variety of, of um, hormones. So, and and we still don't even know entirely what effect that's having on us. That's fascinating. Based on your data, it looks like testosterone is certainly a mediator of some of those uh, effects. Um, Susan Chang had a question. Are there sex-specific molecules measurable in the circulation that appear to be derived from microbial sources? So this is a really interesting question, and there's very little data on that, but the tools are there. Um, they're very early, like actually around the time that Science Paper came out in 2013, there is a really interesting landmark study that came out where they just measured through metabolomics circulating metabolites in the blood of germ-free mice versus normal mice. Um, and they found they could clearly identify from that, you know, what are the microbe-specific metabolites and what were, were, were host, um, host um, metabolites. Now we can actually do that in humans. There's now databases that are better curated to actually distinguish um, the microbial metabolites in, in humans, you know, which were not germ-free. Uh, so um, I believe, yes, uh, that we're better at doing it, but it's not perfect. I think it still commingles with human, uh, human hormone and human measurements, um, but it's much better than, than before. And that field is rapidly evolving. So is that something like exomes um, that you may be able to pull down and uh, differ, you know, determine where they're from and what kind of bacteria they're from? I don't know if that's what Susan was asking, but. Well, it's, it's hard to determine which bacteria they're coming from because there's a lot of what's called functional redundancy in the microbiome where many microbes can make the same thing. And that's an evolutionary conserved process because if you wipe out one set of bugs, you still want to be able to have a compensatory other set of bugs that can continue to, to help you function normally. So it's really hard to pin down uh, uh, which bugs are producing what, but what people are starting to do are, are stable isotope tracer studies where they can actually label some of these, introduce them into models and see which ones are um, being incorporated and where they're going. And, and you can also label uh, bacteria themselves and sort of look at them um, in situ. But what they essentially, the way they sort of extrapolate which ones are the, the microbial ones or not, has been derived from, um, for example, like antibiotic studies, sort of you deplete the microbiota and you see what's left. And there are certain microbes also, it's just well known that they produce metabolites that, that humans don't make. Um, and so anytime you see those in the blood, they only come from, from bacteria. And it's those databases that are actually um, better curated now. Wow, that's mm -hmm. um Sarah, there's one more question from Noel, and maybe I'll take that one, and then I'm going to turn it over to Noel actually to right. to uh, bring us home. So Noel's question um, is: Are there sex difference post radiation in diabetes? Post radiation, like for uh, in like in cancer? Yeah, they just wipe out it like, transiently the microbiome. Yes, yeah, we actually have a study on this right now in rectal cancer where we're looking at radiation therapy for that exact reason, because you're essentially, that's how you sterilize things is using radiation. Um, and, and we have found that those, uh, you know, pre-radiation and post-radiation definitely have changes in their, in their microbiome. And I think it's part of the reason why even for, you know, um, you see this in prostate cancer too, um, but people report having uh, GI, uh, having diarrhea for years after the procedure. You know, you have a really long-term um, uh, perturbation of the microbiome through radiation therapy. And that's something that Stephen Shaw was studying that here, but we there's so much more work to be done in that area. It's really fascinating. Great. Well, thank you, Suzanne. That was really interesting. And I will be emailing you a potential project. <laughs> I look forward to it. All right, Noelle, it's all you. So this has been a wonderful afternoon. Um, we have had a wonderful attendance and people have really hung in there with us. So uh, I, I appreciate your interest. It must be because um, we did a great program. Let me start out by uh, thanking Sylvia, who uh, staffs the cruise, 
and um, amazing. And, and we all got cut off and we all got back on. Um, let me thank all of our speakers. Let me congratulate all of our awardees uh, last year as well as uh, the year coming. And we'll, and you know now uh, your deliverable, which will be to present at our annual symposium uh, so that we all feel like we are making progress. As you can see, there's so much that needs to be done. Uh, so we will be um, finding and discovering knowledge that will address these sex and gender specific knowledge gaps. I would welcome, and because we have the chat, we actually can retain that. If you have ideas right now, just on the moment of things that you would like to see next year, uh, was this too long, too short? Um, hopefully we will not be working remotely, we'll be in person. Normally right now we would have a coffee and um, a little socializing. Um, but uh, so use the chat if you have ideas that uh, are fresh in your mind. Uh, we probably also will be taking notes and uh, we'll be running things by folks. Um, so let me, uh, along with my steering committee members, uh, thank you for attending. And I think we can close unless anybody has anything else they want to say. Well, thank you all. We really appreciate your time and interest. And I think this highlighted even more how much more we need to know about women and gender sex differences to, to perfect or make better uh, our care for women and their families. So thank you all, we really appreciate it. Okay, have a good evening.